Hi, I'm Tassie and welcome back to my channel. If you're a return subscriber, welcome home. And if you're a new subscriber, make yourself at home by clicking that subscribe button. And welcome to another installment of the What Happened To series. So for those of you that are new here, what is the What Happened To series? The What Happened To series is a series that I do on my channel where I cover very popular people and things from pop culture that at one point had a very big impact. And as time went on, they seemingly faded into the background. And today, obviously, we will be talking about the popular girl group, the OMG Girls. Now, before we hop into the video, you know I have to give a disclaimer. This video is for entertainment slash educational purposes. Everything that is mentioned in this video is for the sake of accuracy. Everyone that is mentioned in this video is mentioned for the sake of keeping the timeline in order and making sure that all the information is accurate as possible. If you are someone that doesn't want to be mentioned, that is not my fault, nor is it my problem because I have nothing to do with that. I do these videos for the sake of entertainment. I do not do these videos to be messy. I do not do these videos to spread rumors or anything of that nature. We're all just here to have fun and spread the word and that's pretty much it. And I do wanna give a heads up, in this video, we will be looking at a court case and we will be viewing documents. So even with that, I am not trying to push a narrative, trying to insinuate certain things. I am not giving any ammunition for anything myself as an individual person. This is me just stating facts on my channel and that is it, okay? Okay. So if this sounds like something that you're interested in, please stay tuned. And with that being said, let's get straight into the video. So for starters, who are the OMG girls? The OMG girls were the biggest girl group of the 2010s. Their most notable members consisted of the members Zonique, Beja, and Brianna, also known by the stage names Star, Beauty, and Baby Doll. This group was the product of Tamika, Tiny Harris, and Keisha Miles, who were previous members of the girl group Escape. And from the very beginning of the group's formation, they were signed under the label Pretty Hustle, which was an affiliation to Grand Hustle by the rapper T.I. Even though they formed in 2009, they wouldn't get their big break until 2011 with their biggest hit, Gucci This, Gucci That. Their colorful hair and clothing not only made them stand out, but also inspired a new wave of fashion, makeup, and hairstyles. Their presence caused a shift in the music industry, causing the resurgence of girl groups in the 2010s. With two of the members being descendants of popular artists from the 90s, having Sean Bankhead as their choreographer, making as much noise as they made on their 106 and Park debut, and affiliations with multiple big celebrities like Lil Wayne, Monica, and many, many more, it seemed like the OMG girls had a bright future ahead of them. But unfortunately, in March of 2015, they would announce that the group was officially disbanding after seven years. And after all this time, fans would never get an official album, they would never get an official tour, and they were left with multiple unfinished and unreleased singles. So that leads to the question, what happened to the OMG girls and why were there so many unreleased singles and why is there still no album? So one of the obstacles that I want to address first is definitely the privileged background that they come from. And in order to understand how this was an obstacle in the development of their careers, we have to go all the way to the very beginning and work our way up. So in the early 2010s, it definitely seemed as if there was like a huge surge of child actors and child entertainers in general just coming out of nowhere. Almost everything was targeted towards children, tweens, teenagers, like it was just a kid's world at that time. Now being a child star was nothing new, but it seemed like during this time, it was just way more prevalent because we had things like the Disney Channel that would sometimes have a whole entire cast filled with nothing but children for these children's shows. A lot of their actors were becoming billionaires before they even hit the age of 15. And then we also had platforms like YouTube and MySpace that kind of went hand in hand with each other. And that's how we got artists like Nicki Minaj and Justin Bieber, just to name a few. So the reason for this big surge was mainly because now it was easily accessible to become famous essentially. But even then, everyone didn't become mainstream overnight. It still took a decent amount of work. So while all of this was going on, 
Boy bands and girl groups were being developed, but not many of them would make it and not many of the ones that made it would actually stay in the spotlight for a very long time. So we had groups like the Pussycat Dolls, we had groups like Danity Kane, but they wouldn't last very long and they definitely weren't targeted towards children or teenagers. We had groups like 3LW that somehow spun off into the Cheetah Girls, but even the Cheetah Girls had issues with their group members and staying consistent and making sure that the flow of content was really, you know, up to par. But not only that, by the time that the 2010s came in, the Cheetah Girls slash 3LW, they were not teenagers anymore. They were very much grown women that were basically cosplaying as teenagers because they were doubling as actors on a movie franchise as well as trying to release music. So they weren't as relatable as people would have predicted for the teenagers and tweenagers of that time. So it's fair to say that during this time period, the last decent, well-known, very successful girl group was Destiny's Child, and they broke up in 2006, so that's saying something. But luckily, this is when the OMG girls would step on the scene. So in late 2008 to early 2009, Tamika Tiny Harris, a former member of the girl group Escape, would actually come together with her fellow bandmate Keisha Miles and develop the OMG Girls. Now the original group consisted of her biological daughter Zonique, the daughter of the rapper Lil Wayne, Regine, the daughter of Jonathan Rasboro from the group Silk named Beja, and Beja's half-sister Lourdes. They would then go on to be referred to as their stage names, Star, Baby Carter, Beauty, and Lolo. Now, as I specified before, they had very big major affiliations with various different popular celebrities, but their biggest push would definitely come from the fact that they were featured on the reality show Tiny and Toya. Now, the show Tiny and Toya was really a show depicting the lives of Tiny and the ex-wife of Lil Wayne, Toya, and how they navigated their new lives trying to venture into new opportunities, into new images of themselves, and of course, raising their children, which also happened to be the members of the girl group, the OMG Girls. Time would go on and eventually Regine would leave the group. The group would be a trio for a while and then the member Lolo actually ended up getting kicked out of the group for her age. The OMG girls then decided that they wanted to rebrand and they started to go through artist development and become a more mature look and a more mature sound. This is when they would introduce a new member of the group named Brianna, also known as Baby Doll. So shortly after the addition of Baby Doll, they would have three singles and one very popular snippet under their belt. So there was no mixtape, there was no EP, and there was no album. It was only singles and a snippet. And yet with this, they were able to go on the Scream Tour, not once, but twice. And for those that may not know, the Scream Tour was a tour that was targeted towards teenagers, tweenagers, and you know, adolescents. And it basically was all of the artists that were popular during that time, like everybody who was just the big thing at that time. So to be considered a big thing and you don't have an official album, you don't have an EP, you don't have a mixtape, you quite literally only have three singles and a snippet. That was a huge accomplishment. That, that was almost never done before. So they got another big push by being featured on another reality show, which was T.I. and Tiny the Family Hustle. They weren't necessarily the main characters, obviously, but from time to time, you would definitely see the development of the OMG girls, whether it would be them at a photo shoot, whether it would be them shooting a music video, and et cetera, et cetera. They would go on to make multiple appearances in music videos, and they even have a cameo in the movie School Dance. And it doesn't stop there. It does not stop there. They would also end up going on tour again multiple times by being opening acts for artists like Diggy Simmons and Mindless Behavior. And by the time all this stuff happened, they released about five more singles and they repeatedly started to tease their album release. However, as we stated before, time would go on and there still was no album. And at least the fans had the singles that were released, but even with the singles, a lot of those singles that were released weren't officially released. So majority of them, you can only find them on YouTube. And then some of them, 
they're still technically snippets. They're not actually official studio audios that are released to the public. They also teased, I think, a total of like three songs that just never got released. So one of them was Fresh, the other one was My Click, and the other one was Bad Boy. We never, never got to actually hear the finishing product of any of those songs. But let's also talk about their performance abilities and also their presence in interviews and in public situations as well. One of the biggest qualms that people had about the OMG girls when they first broke out was that in a lot of their performances, it's very clear that they're lip syncing. And it wasn't all the time, but it was a decent hefty chunk of the time. The girls were always lip syncing. And then there would be times where sometimes the performances were hit or miss. Sometimes it would have a lot of energy. And then in other cases, it wouldn't. Sometimes you could visually tell that somebody had forgot the steps. And there's a decent amount of interviews where the energy is also very lackluster. Like you can tell that some of them just did not want to be there. You could tell that they were very tired. Sometimes the answers were very short, sweet, and to the point. So, you know, after a while, the fans kind of did start to see the cracks of the group and start to notice a lot of these issues and a lot of these things. And it seemed like the more that time went on, these things started to get worse and worse. Making a huge splash fresh out in your career is not something that everybody has the privilege of being able to do. Being able to go on tour with technically only one song under your belt, because the other songs that I mentioned, they were for the new variation of the OMG Girls, but the old variation of the OMG Girls had about, what, two, three songs from them? So as the new version of the OMG Girls, with OMG Girls 2011, you had one song. To have only one song under your belt and be invited to be on the Scream Tour, that is a huge, huge, huge accomplishment. And that should not be taken lightly. So with them having such big splashes fresh out the gate twice, being on tour twice, being an opening act twice, and so many more other benefits that were out there, why is it that it seems like the material is not matching the resources. So, fun fact that is unbeknownst to a lot of people, the OMG girls were never supposed to be a real girl group. When the show Tiny and Toya was being aired and being in development, what a lot of reality TV does is that they will kind of try to push narratives or shift a storyline to go a certain way or look a certain way. The only thing that makes it reality TV is that you don't have a script to read. You're not playing a character, you're living your everyday life. However, if they want a sense of, mm, this needs to be a little bit more entertaining, they will up the ante and try to recommend you go here, you do this, you do that, right? And this isn't a new concept because believe it or not, a lot of the vlog channels that y'all watch, they do the same exact thing. It's not that they fake their everyday lives. It's not like they fake being a person for the cameras, but have you never questioned why every time you watch a new video from them, they're always going to Costco? They're always going to Whole Foods? How are you going to the grocery store this frequently? And why? Like, what's that about? And it's because they're giving themselves something to do. The average person, you would just buy your groceries for the month and just be okay like you never have to go to the grocery store ever again if you live by yourself then maybe you go like bi-weekly or something like that but to go almost every single day you think that's realistic no they're doing it on purpose you think they absolutely need to go to starbucks and drink coffee every single day absolutely not they're doing it on purpose this is nothing new so this is basically what the situation was with the development of the omg girls so tiny's whole synopsis while she was on the show was that she had taken time off from her music career to become a mother and a wife to the rapper ti but while she decided to dedicate her life to essentially being a homemaker there was still a part of her where she still had a desire to have her hand in music because music was something that she grew up with and it was all that she knew 
So even though she decided that she would give up her music career, she never wanted to completely let go of music in general. So her alternative was that she was going to start managing and creating artists, music groups, etc., etc. So I'm not sure if this is still a part of the Grand Hustle label or if it was rebranded, but originally the label that she created was actually called Major P. And the only artists that were under this label, Major P, was actually a girl group named Juice. And if you go back and you actually watch the seasons of Tiny and Toya, it's very clear in the first season that Juice was really the girl group that was being promoted. Juice was the girl group that was being pushed. They were supposed to be the ones to benefit off of the reality TV show. So where did the OMG girls come from? So it could be one of two things. Number one, the network probably wanted Tiny to be in a more chaotic situation. Because the smart thing to do is to start off small when you have a brand new label. So having only one girl group or one artist attached to your label, that's actually decent. You know, it, it helps you understand what you're capable of doing, what you can't do. But for the sake of TV, was it exciting enough? Was it hectic enough? Probably not. So the network probably recommend that instead of just only focusing on Juice, she tried to do multiple artists or even better, multiple girl groups at once. Now the second reason I feel like could have been Tiny on her own. Zonique had always had a desire to become a singer and break out into the music career herself. And of course her mom wanted the same thing for her. So it's possible that Tiny probably formed the show to give a lot of attention to her daughter, but because of how seemingly shy Zonique was, she probably thought to herself like maybe she'll thrive a little bit more and a little bit better if she was in an actual physical group as opposed to just being a solo artist. And the reason why I have this theory, quick little fun fact, before the OMG girls, Zanique actually was a part of a girl group and they were a duo. So this girl group was actually called the Cutie Posse. And this consisted of Zanique, obviously, and also an artist that was formerly known as Cutie Jazz. But eventually Jazz wanted to go solo, so the band disbanded and I guess Zanique took a break from then. And then we got to the point to where Tiny and Toya show launches and her mom tries to push her to sing the song that she wrote. So the other additional members of the group, which again were Beja, Regine, and Lourdes, the thing about these groups of girls is that they weren't just friends. They technically were raised up with each other like they were family. So she basically created a girl group with her cousins. So according to Beja, the way that the group formed was that one day Tiny just called up everybody's mom and said, hey, I got to shoot this show. Can you bring the girls over? That way we can do a few scenes. And then after that, they can go home. When all of it got started, we were, well, at the time, my, my auntie Tamika was filming Tiny and Toya. Mm -hmm. And so she had called my mom and she's like, you know, I want to do this group for the show. It was just got, like going to be like an episode for the show, I believe. Mm -hmm. She's like, I want to do this group for the show. Bring Beige, bring Lordy. So my mom's like, all right, cool. So realistically, the storyline of the OMG girls and their development and, and seeing them grow so that they can put on this performance at this showcase, that was literally supposed to be for season one and season one only. That was supposed to be an eventual throwaway storyline. But unbeknownst to everybody, there were little girls that were watching Tiny and Toya as well. The demographic for the show was really supposed to be people in their 20s to 30s, predominantly, you know, black women. But I guess if we all live the same childhood, you know, it would just come a day where your mom sits down and she does your hair and you're pretty much by default watching whatever your mama's watching on TV because, you know, you between her legs getting your hair braided. Like you ain't really, you can't really go nowhere. You can't really say anything. You can't really do anything. So yeah, it's a large possibility by default, a whole bunch of little girls just seen the OMG girls performing and they fell in love. So the next thing you know, the OMG girls are getting demands to be booked for birthday parties and different events that are happening in the city of Atlanta. Like they're now becoming a sought out group. Now as for Juice, Juice had their own qualms about them. 
apparently there was issues between like different group members some of them were serious some of them weren't i think some of them were beefing with each other so they were having their own issues and once they seen the success and the attention that the omg girls were getting again it could have been the network it could have been tiny but juice got put on the back burner and just magically disappeared and and we just don't know what happened to them after that to my knowledge, the last thing that I seen was on their official Twitter page. They were holding auditions for new members, so a significant amount of the members had left initially, but after that, dead silent. So, Juice is no more, and the OMG girls get to return for the second season, and they get way more screen time than what they did the first season. So now we in the year 2010, okay? Now the OMG girls have a vocal coach, a talent coach, a choreographer. They're practicing day in and day out. Plus, believe it or not, even though it is reality TV, being filmed, period, is a lot of work and it takes a lot of energy out of you. So while all of this is going on, they are also basically now the main characters of a reality show that they didn't even sign up for. And if you look at the old clips, you can clearly tell that a lot of them are irritated. A lot of them are visibly tired. Like they're just not really all that excited as they were initially when it came to forming the OMG girls. Now I will say this, you have to factor in how young they were. Zonique and Beja were about what, like 12, 13 years old. And Regine and Lourdes were about like nine or 10. So like they're really young kids. They don't know nothing about work ethic. They don't know nothing about, you know, being consistent and practicing and stuff like that. But the reason why I'm pointing all of this out is because it very much has to do with the reason why we end up getting to a point to where you start to see hit or miss performances and you start to kind of notice the cracks and the not so pretty side of the OMG girls as far as them being artists. Now, mind you, we are talking about the OMG girls that were developed in 2009 that lasted until like 2010 or at least early 2011. This group was not supposed to be a group for real. This group was not really supposed to make it off the ground. This was not something that was supposed to happen. It happened out of nowhere. So just imagine if you were like a little kid and you decided that you wanted to run a lemonade stand because I don't know, like you want some extra money or maybe you just wanted to be able to say that you ran a lemonade stand when you were younger, who knows? So you're successful the first day and you're good. You go home with your jar of nickels and quarters and pennies and you put them in your piggy bank and you're just going to sleep and you're, you're content. And then you wake up the next day, 10 a.m. People are at your front door, knocking on the door, demanding more lemonade. They want more. You got an interview with Oprah tomorrow. When did that happen? Oh, you got to go on the news tomorrow. For what? Okay, you got a scheduled meeting on Thursday. We have to talk about productivity. We have to hire a team. You need new employees for your marketing agency. Like, what? Wait a minute. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. A bitch just wanted to sell lemonade what is going on here that's essentially what happened to the omg girls you know we filmed the episode everything's fine it's like we're living a regular life when it came on tv like we literally started getting like bookings like everybody was going crazy like who are these girls like we want to see them you know Whoa. and so that's when my aunt was like oh this gotta be a real thing because like kids really like them for real you know like at first it was just gonna be like a tv type thing and once everybody saw the potential of it that's when we was like oh yeah it gotta be serious and they all were aware that they were a part of a storyline this was not supposed to be something legit and then seemingly overnight they become this this legitimate group and they have to perform at this birthday party they have to go to this event and now it's we need a talent agency we need a choreographer we need a stylist we need this we need that after school we got to go to practice for the weekend we have an event to go to now we have to go into artist development now we have to go into a focus group and give them a listening party so that we can see what we need to work on or not that's a lot and for that to come out of the blue yeah nobody's really gonna be that that excited so it's not a surprise that eventually Regine was the first person to leave the group she was just like this is too much for me 
I don't want to do this anymore and, and she chucked the deuces up okay and once they went through their rebrand and they kicked Lourdes out the group and added Brianna they then went into artist development and of course came out becoming way more motivated for their careers so you would think that with this second wave that would be you know the push that would be the moment where it's like okay they're locked in they're getting ready like everything's gonna be spick and span so why was there still certain areas that were very spotty so I want you guys to keep it in mind that also during this time period, this was during the social media boom. So we now are shifting into an era where a lot of specifically artists, let's just focus on the artists, specifically artists are now starting to use their social media platforms as like a behind the scenes look and how they come to be. So one of the popular niches that a lot of artists did at the time was post little pictures and videos of them rehearsing. They would sometimes post a selfie just to let it be known that they're in like a specific city and then they would like, you know, put the geolocation on their photos. Sometimes you got videos of them going to sound check, et cetera, et cetera. So now we're at a phase in life where fans of specific musical artists, they want more than just the music. They want content outside of the musical content, outside of the concerts. They want to see the artist development, essentially. They want to see you practice. They want to see what all goes on in order to get the performances that we get. Now with the OMG girls, they got content. They did get content. But majority of their content was not related to their career. Their photos and their videos that they would upload, it quite literally just showed them being regular teenage girls. They went to the mall, they went to parties, they had sleepovers with each other. They would document their days where they're just chilling at home. They had time to go prom dress shopping. And again, I don't do mess on my channel, but I do remember this day very clearly. It was funny. So, you know, we're just having a little key. But I do remember that there was a point in time where they were on tour. I'm not sure which tour that was, but they were on tour and they recorded themselves stealing a car. All right, hey Keek, what's hey. going on? There's Anique, there's Bree, and I'm behind the camera. And as you guys can see, we have stolen this car. Um, so y'all can't like post any pictures. <laughs> or screenshot this i'm for real y'all because y'all gotta keep our and Womack finds out we're dead and y'all have to keep our secret oh my god this is a team omg secret little secret escape so we're in traffic right now we're <laughs> oh that's a fun time. i can't believe we stole this car it's just so stupid oh my god what does something happen to us we're gonna live love you guys bye <laughs> how you got time to steal a car on tour like when, when did what when did this happen now I will say this, I am a very big firm believer in just because it's not being posted does not mean that it's not happening. That's just me personally. But I will say from the perspective of the OMG Girls fan base, as well as outsiders that could have been potential fans, it just looked like the OMG Girls were lollygagging. It just looked like they weren't taking their career seriously and they weren't putting in that time and effort into putting into their craft. So when we see videos and pictures of y'all just, you know, living life, doing what you want to do, and then we see a performance where, you know, you kind of messing up a little bit and you not hitting certain notes and, you know, it's been like, what, 10 shows consecutively and we haven't heard you sing live, not once. Fans started to kind of put two and two together and it just gave the, the impression that like, oh, this is a joke to you. Okay, cool. And even with the member Brianna, also known as Baby Doll, the other thing that was a little bit odd, well not all the way odd, but it was a little teeny weeny bit odd. Brianna wasn't from Atlanta like Zonique and Beja. Brianna was from Mobile, Alabama. And there would be a hefty amount of times where they would either be on live or they would be on Keek. Do y'all remember Keek? And it was always mentioned that Brianna was back at home or that she was on her way and she was coming from home. <laughs> okay guys, so, so what's going on? So first off, y'all don't see Bree here and Bree's on the way. From Mobile. So she will be here. She's trying to get here as fast as she can, but the weather's really bad and it's supposed to be like a tornado watch. So yes. we're telling her just not to rush it. You know what I mean? Like just get <clears throat> here safe. 
you know, because we don't want her to get here, like, and be hurt or anything, so. Hey, hi, hello, sorry, hi, hi. hello again, sorry, yes. What's up, what's what, up? What, that vibe, he was like, he did, did it again. Oh, yeah, what's up, 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 Oh, I can't even get to my gym. Oh, she can't even sit down. Wait, no, 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 this is, the, this is the one that I was trying to show. So it's like this girl lives in a completely different state and is traveling back and forth, back and forth, back and forth from what it seems like is very frequently. Now, in a lot of cases, for the sake of people's careers, they usually relocate and they live in the city that is gonna help their career flourish. Now again, just because it's not posted does not mean that it's not happening. And as I tell y'all all the time, we do not know these people personally. So I don't know if Brianna and her family had 100% relocated to Atlanta but it was just very clear that she was not spending the bulk of her time in Atlanta which she has every right to do but again from the perspective of the fan base it just seems like there's always a disconnect between Brianna and the rest of the group and that also was contributing to practices and vocal practices and rehearsals and stuff like that like it just seemed like that was the leading force as well into why certain performances would be lackluster because how are y'all practicing with only two people how are y'all practicing and brianna is practically never there so i mean just by looking at it at face value it does seem like the omg girls had way more free time as opposed to a lot of their peers that were in the same industry but i will say this though i will say this i don't feel like they weren't working hard i wouldn't insinuate that they weren't like giving it their all and giving it their 110 percent but i will say that it was a clear difference between them and their peers simply because a lot of their peers were those types of kids where it's like this career of mine is paying bills this career of mine is keeping the lights on this career of mine is something that i have wanted since the age of three four five six we're just now getting to a level head where I feel like my hard work is paying off. I don't have time to lollygag. I don't have time to go to the mall. I don't have time to go to parties. I don't have time to go back to my hometown, say hi to everybody and come back. Like I have to be focused. I have to be driven. I have to, I have to really lock in. But with the OMG girls, again, they come from a life where, to be honest, they ain't have to go into the music industry if they didn't want to. They didn't have to get a job if they didn't want to. They quite literally could have did whatever they wanted to do because they were going to be set financially anyways. Like I said earlier, we were in an era where it was way easier to get famous, but baby, it still took time to get to where you needed to be, especially to see the payoff. With the OMG girls, they had access to the best studio equipment. They already had ties with whoever celebrity they wanted to get in contact with because they all grew up together. You even had some of them, they was signed to people's labels. They were signed to T.I.'s label, Lil Wayne's YMCMB, you know, like the, these people were already in cahoots with them. So if they wanted to hop on a song, they quite literally could have just hopped on a song and been cool. Meanwhile, other people, they had to break their neck to make those connections. Y'all got it by default. Back in the early 2000s, getting a reality TV show, that was like the cream of the crop. That was like basically the equivalent of going viral on TikTok or having a lot of followers on Instagram. That was the way to get your name out there. You got to be on two reality shows. Two. Again, that's not an easy feat. Everybody can't say that they did that. So it's fair to say that like, again, I wouldn't say that they didn't work hard, but it's very clear that they didn't take full, full, full access to their resources that they had. But it was because they didn't have to. They, they genuinely didn't have to. Everything was gonna work in their favor regardless. So can we really be mad? Not really. But another thing that I feel like we have to factor in as well is that these were children okay these were children and they had to follow the rules of their parents they had to follow the rules of the label that they were signed to so in a way yeah they could have been had an ep they could have been had an album but who's really pulling the strings behind the scenes because they're not managing themselves they're not producing the album themselves so it's not all their fault that certain things aren't going and looking a certain way because that's what their team of people is for. The team is supposed to make sure that y'all are as consistent as y'all need to be. So again, we can't really fault them. It's the whole system.
And also with them needing to appeal to these labels and appeal to the adults in their lives, it goes back to the conversation that I had in the previous installment about the Rangers. Just because it seems like you have a lot of good connections, it doesn't mean that everything is going to be smooth sailing. There's still a lot of work that goes behind these things. There's still a lot of payments that need to be made. Studio time needs to be paid for. Songwriters need to be paid. Producers need to be paid. Going on tour, your own tour, that costs actually a lot of money. Now, tours are usually the biggest, you know, money grabber but it takes a lot of money just to make the money back a lot so the average person when they look at people like the omg girls or they look at people that just have these really big affiliations with people they think in the back of their head that they can just i don't know like walk up to ti and lil wayne and ask them for a million dollars so they can go on tour and it's just boom there it is that's not how that works that's not how that works. It's a whole process, okay? It's a whole process when you write a song. It's a whole process when you go on tour. It's a whole process when you shoot a music video. Like, there's a lot of interworkings that go in there, okay? So, honest to God, I do feel like overall it was really a reflection on their team and their management team more than it was a reflection on them as individual people or as individual artists. But either way it goes, it just goes to show that these girls were not as on their P's and Q's as they probably should have been. And when it came time to perform and actually produce the content, it showed. So to wrap this segment up, how exactly did this impact their careers? Now, as I said, they had a lot of peers that were working with less material that were pretty much outperforming them. But another thing that I feel like a lot of people don't take into consideration is that by the mid to late 2010s, we started to see a lot more other girl groups come into development. As I said before, the OMG girls opened the door and inspired a lot of people to get hype about girl groups and boy bands all over again. The presence of the OMG girls caused a lot of girl groups to just appear out of nowhere. So at this point, we got groups like We Are Charm, Endless, and even the school girls that kind of gave off the same similar vibe of the OMG girls. Now don't get it twisted, it's only one OMG. But realistically speaking, they were all in the same ballpark at this point in time. Initially, when the OMG girls had came out, it was just them and Juice, but we already talked about Juice. We're not gonna talk about that no more. But yeah, pretty much the OMG girls had this in the bag. They took advantage of that moment and they ran with it. So now we have more options. We have other little black girls that look just like us, that put their swag on just like everybody else so what do we need the omg girls for now mind you i already covered we are charm on this channel i told y'all about everything that they went through they didn't had thirteen thousand different members they didn't fought each other one person got burned okay they didn't had drama since the very beginning and yet they have a project and they can release them projects you see them perform and and i gotta be real i gotta be completely honest not mad at any of their performances because like i do a deep dive on this video i did a deep dive on everybody that i cover and i will say i've watched almost every single performance of we are charm i really have no complaints besides the fact that there were times where tay would be a little bit off sometimes she would forget the choreography and sometimes she would you know mess up some lines or whatever but all in all there was just good presentation across the board and once tay got replaced oh they was unstoppable and then they stop but you know like they they were unstoppable for the time that they wasn't stopping so the thing is is that if other people are starting to see like okay there's all these other girl groups that are working with less and they're producing more than the omg girls that have all these resources that have all these connections and have been in business way longer than anybody else what is the point of giving the omg girls another chance what's the point of giving them another shot and keep in mind, I'm just talking about fans. I'm just talking about the general public. You think businesses aren't paying attention to stuff like that? You think labels and, and potential brand deals aren't noticing that stuff too? And again, this was during the, the climb of social media and social media fame. And that's one thing that We Are Charm did do correct. Well, kind of, sort of. But We Are Charm took advantage of their social media presence, okay? So yeah, it's like if we have all these options now, what is the point of giving you chance after chance, time after time, and we're not really seeing a change? After so many years of waiting, even the most dedicated fan is gonna get bored and leave eventually. 
But before we wrap this segment up, I do want to say this. I am kind of happy that they did have a team of people that cared about preserving their youth and preserving them as children. Because knowing what we know now about the entertainment industry and how it was so predatory towards a lot of child actors and a lot of child entertainers, they definitely got the better end of the whole entire situation. I'm really happy that we don't hear any crazy stories about any of them. I'm very thankful that, you know, they had people in their lives that could step in between that and be like, hey, no, you know, and they got to live their lives as normal kids. They weren't completely overworked, but they weren't completely coddled either. I do like that in retrospect. I do like that. So yeah, it can be identified that maybe we should have put in a little bit more work, a little bit more effort, and the management team could have did a little bit better. But on the other hand, I'm just thankful that they didn't get wrapped up in mess and then we would be making a whole completely different kind of video. So another thing that would hinder the growth of the OMG girls was definitely the OMG girls being way ahead of their time. So the biggest thing that people take away from the OMG girls when we talk about them, they always talk about how the OMG girls were big trendsetters in the black community, specifically to black young girls. Growing up as a black girl, you are often policed on how you present yourself and how you are able to express yourself. I wouldn't say that we didn't have freedom, but there were a lot of like unofficial, unspoken policies that we grew up having. One of them being, you're not allowed to wear hair weave because hair weave is too grown. You're not allowed to wear hair color because hair color is too grown. You can't have red nail polish because apparently you a street walker. And don't let you be a thick little girl. Don't let you be a naturally plump little girl. Now all of a sudden you can't wear shorts. You got to wear one piece bathing suits while everybody else got their bikinis. And you start having body image issues because it's like, dang, is my family trying to call me fat? But then it's like, if they don't take those precautions, then you're more than likely to get preyed on by inappropriate people because you thick with it and you got on a two-piece bathing suit. It was just a lot to deal with as a young black girl growing up. Some of these policies, it was to keep us safe and it was to keep us pure as long as possible, but it also hindered a lot of our freedom of expression. So after how many generations, I don't even know, of having these unofficial policies repeated over and over and over again to the point where it's just programmed in our brains to believe such things. Imagine everybody's shock when the OMG girls first came on the scene and they got stripes of color in their hair and they got these tutus, these big gigantic colorful puffy tutus and I don't want to say the wrong thing I don't want to be wrong but if I'm being completely honest I feel like the OMG girls were the first people that I seen that actually wore the knee-high converse I could be wrong about that but I swear they were the first people that I seen with that and then the next thing you know everybody had these knee-high converse everybody had tutus everybody was putting birthday outfits together with tutus I remember it was picture day at my school when I was in middle school when I tell you everybody everybody had on the tutus the little neck gloves on the hands and like this Aeropostale shirt that would match and some Jordans and and I swear on everything I love that was a movement and even around that time people started to let their daughters experiment with color finally so now everybody running the Claire's and getting them little synthetic strips and putting them in their head and some people they had a real cool mom and they mom let them dye their hair okay so yeah the omg girls opened the floodgates they swung them open and they ain't been closed ever since and you can only imagine that when the omg girls went through the rebrand and they went from streaks in their hair to full-blown solid colors not only did they pop out with the color but the hair down to the butt never has been done before no joke because even though by this point it was a given that people wear hair weave and hair weave was not a new invention, hair weave was still somehow taboo. It was still like a very iffy type of topic. So the goal at that time was still to keep it as natural as possible. So it's already bad enough that you got this color. It's already bad enough that you got the color. But usually people would go for like a realistic length. So my length really ain't that realistic. I don't even know how many inches this is. It's a decent amount, but you know, it ain't completely super duper long, right? So people would usually aim for like right here, 
little bit right here possibly like you know right here or something because that was like a realistic length you know but 40 inch hair 40 inch hair was hard to come by 40 inch hair was like too much hair okay it, it was just entirely too much so when your hair is that long people can tell that it's fake so when they did that they did they big one nobody was seeing them girls not even close and just like before they had so many girls and even grown people run into the hair store getting the longest inches they could find the biggest amount of hair dye that they could find and getting that sew in with whatever color they wanted and since this version of the omg girls was more mature it also was reflected in their makeup as well this is when you started to see the bright colored lips this is when you started to get all the funky crazy colors and people obsessing over mac cosmetics for this vibrant neon pink neon green and even down to their clothing the clothing that they would wear on stage was always loud it was always eye-catching it was always something that just made you take a double take now them on a regular day clothes were very chill but it was still a representation of just free-spirited teenagers not only did they set a trend for makeup fashion and hair let's also talk about how low-key the omg girls created the name baddies you heard me correctly they created the name baddies so basically what had happened was their demographic that they were appealing to was obviously supposed to be at least pg-13 so we can talk about boys we can talk about being cute we can talk about being paid but we can't cuss and we can't, you know, be too raunchy and too wild. We gotta still keep it cute. So of course these girls couldn't go on stage and go on a record and refer to themselves as bad bitches. Even though that was, you know, what was implied. That was what it was giving. So they come up with the term baddie. It's just a short variation of bad. It gave off a similar vibe. You understood what it meant when you said it you know and it's not that baddie wasn't even originally a word it had always been a word but the original context it basically meant like a super villain in a movie that's what the baddie was basically the final boss that's what a baddie was they took the word baddie and made it to what it is today so they made that term and they made a song titled baddies and ever since then the world has changed because i know there's a big chunk of people that probably thought that the show baddies on zeus was all coming from natalie nunn no it was not it did not come from natalie nunn it did not come from a separate variation of the bad girls club or what it meant to be a bad girl no that came from the omg girls it literally came from the omg girls and to prove my point and to really, really put a stamp on it, the OMG girls were the reason why Beyonce joined Instagram and gave herself the screen name Batty B. So um, Beyonce is performing Sunday. Yes. And I hear tell a rumor that you guys named her her Instagram name. Is that true? Yes. yes. <laughs> tell me how that happened. Well, we were on like a, we did a ish list. It was a video and they said, you know, we know you guys look up to Beyonce a lot. So what would you like to call her? And we was like, you know, a baddie because that's what she is. And then she like wrote us a letter and she was like, you know, I love you guys. And I watched your video and that's where I got my name from. We were just so excited because we love Beyonce. We're all in love with her. So we're excited for her performance on Sunday. Yes. And as female performers, she's one of our all time idols. Beyonce. So let us break it down for you. We're going to tell you seven reasons why Beyonce is such a baddie. You heard. So the big question is, how is this an obstacle? Because it seems like everything is going good. These seem like very positive things. These are very positive accolades. Well, like I said, they were ahead of their time. This particular era was not ready for any of that. Time and time again, these girls were always met with some type of criticism and some type of controversy about how they presented themselves out in public. There were so many comments talking about how they look too grown, they look ratchet, they look tacky. And these were rhetorics coming from people that were even past the age to be old enough to be their mamas. 
But again, there was a programming that was in a lot of young girls that we had just been accustomed to for generations upon generations. So it also was a situation of people, even their age, even their peers, kind of had the same mindset because that's just all we knew and that's just what we were taught. So even though we can look back on it and be like them was them girls at that time, they were public enemy number one. And I wouldn't be surprised if there was some parents that were like, yeah, my daughter can't listen to the OMG girls because they're demonic. I, I wouldn't be surprised because that was really the vibes that they was getting. Like these girls were getting crucified. Okay, crucified at 16, 17 years old because they wanted pink hair down to the butt. And like I said in the We Are Charm video, you know, this was also during an era where like crop tops and shorts were like racy. It was, it was like, oh my God, you might as well walk outside with your underwear. I hate when people be like, you're showing off too much of your body, put some clothes on. I live in Georgia, it's nine degrees outside. Looking back on it now though, that was child's play, okay? That was nothing compared to what would come, all right? So they were in the right time period, but they were in the wrong time period to get their flowers. They wouldn't get their flowers until years later. Now, this is the part of the video where we're gonna start talking about this court case, okay? So I just wanna let it be advised. Again, I'm not pushing a narrative. I'm not insinuating anything. I am not doing anything but just reporting the facts as they are because that's what it is and that's how it happened okay i don't want to be caught up in this i have nothing to do with this but it's a freedom of speech so i'm gonna speak on it you already know you already know you already know let's get into it so let me start off by saying that i myself am not that educated in legal processes i do not have a law degree i am not a lawyer so i will not be using or at least trying to refrain from using a lot of legal terminology because i myself i i don't know a whole lot i know a decent amount though i know a decent amount though but i don't know a whole lot so please understand that the way that i am speaking i'm speaking in layman's terms i'm not speaking as a official legal personnel or, or whatever you want to call it i'm speaking in a way where i want all of us to be on the same page so essentially what i'm going to be doing is summarizing the course of events throughout this court case but for those that are interested i do have links to a lot of the court documents down below i also have megan cuniff um her twitter threads as well as her articles and as well as some of her own documents that she was able to obtain herself so all of those things will be linked down below as well as this woman that I found on TikTok. Hopefully she has a playlist of it and I can just link the playlist. If she doesn't have a playlist, I'll just put her at name down here and you can just search her at name and then search up OMG Girls MGA and everything should pop up. So yeah, those are the resources that you can look at if you're not pleased with the way that I'm coming off or whatever that is perfectly fine I promise I will not be offended but yeah just giving a heads up I'm probably not gonna sound the most intelligent retelling this story because I'm trying to make it you know palatable for everybody so let's move on so in December 2020 the OMG girls would find themselves in a lawsuit with MGA Entertainment Incorporated due to the company allegedly using their likeness in their doll collection so in 2016, MGA Entertainment Incorporated, which was most popular for their line of Bratz dolls, were going to create a new line of dolls called the LOL Surprise Dolls. These dolls, similar to the Bratz dolls, were mainly focused on fashion, but the twist to them was that they had a lot of colorful aspects. Now this was not new for a lot of the dolls that were coming out in the 2010s. This was not new for MGA as a whole. MGA is known for putting out things that are eye-catching. MGA is known for being very fashion-based and fashion-forward. So realistically, none of these things were an issue. None of these things were a problem. But at some point, Tamika Tiny Harris found herself being confronted by multiple people questioning if she had anything to do with this particular brand of dolls. So after a while, Tiny decided to do her own research and look into this mysterious doll line that people kept referring to. And as she did her research, she discovered a line of dolls under the LOL Surprise Doll brand called the OMG dolls. So with the name alone, it obviously caught her eye as well as other people, which is why she had so many people coming up to her, assuming that the dolls had to do with her brand, which was the OMG girls. 
but Tiny was completely unaware of this collection's existence. As she dug into deeper research, she started to find that there were a lot of dolls that were mimicking a lot of the outfits and the hairstyles and the makeup of the OMG girls during their prime. Not to mention, even the story behind the dolls were very similar to the OMG girls. So as we previously discussed, the OMG girls had changed their acronym of OMG to officially misguided, which meant girls that guide other girls and inspire others to do the same. So where did the name OMG girls come from? Well, we were in a studio one day and we were trying to think of like names and we came up with a lot of crazy stuff and OMG, like we were thinking of texts like people, like how we text and we like a little text talking and OMG girls is one of them and everybody just kind of fell in love with it and it means officially miss with two S's guided, which means girls who are guided and girls who guide other girls. Okay. And as we've already previously stated, there were a lot of girl groups that followed after them. So even in that sense, they were essentially the blueprint for a lot of the girls that came after them and were essentially the big sisters of the music industry, or at least in that genre. So when we look into the OMG dolls, the OMG dolls stood for outrageous millennial girls. And their whole thing was being the older sisters to the LOL BB dolls. So when we look into the OMG dolls, the OMG dolls were actually a singing group as well. And the nail in the coffin for Tiny was that they eventually released another line of dolls within that same collection. And one of the dolls who also had a storyline of being a singer was labeled Major Lady. Now, as we previously talked about, when Tiny made her label Major P, she was very brand spanking new with that label. So in order to help promote the label, she essentially made it a part of her tagline and a part of her usernames on various different social media platforms. So on Instagram, she is Major Girl. On Twitter, she is Tiny Major's Mama. Also keep in mind that Major is the name of her son. So all of these things were inspired by him. So that to Tiny was enough to insinuate that, yeah, this had to have been heavily inspired by the OMG girls as well as my brand. So Tiny talked it over with her lawyer and they wrote up a cease and desist and sent it to MGA. Shortly after this, MGA would not only decline the cease and desist, but they would also turn around and decide to take T.I., Tiny, and the OMG girls to court. And as a response, T.I. and Tiny decided to counter sue for copyright infringement. Now, I will say with the little bit of knowledge that I do have as far as the legal process, I will say that I did not see the OMG girls win in this case whatsoever, simply because copyright infringement, trademark infringement, just arguing over the rights of stuff in general is a very hard thing to prove. So if you've been here long enough, then you remember the conversation that we had when I did the What Happened to Barbie Doll Gang video. There is always someone who was inspired by somebody else and so on and so forth. By the time that it hits this one particular person, it's went through so many people that at this point, the product or the trend at hand probably isn't even similar to where it originally came from. So with that being said, it's really hard to prove if someone is copying directly off of the source or if they really genuinely were inspired by other sources. And with the era of the 2010s essentially being that time period where people were experimenting with a lot of different styles, a lot of different colors, a lot of different aesthetics, it would be really difficult to fully pinpoint that the OMG girls are the ones that are being copied. And even with the color schemes, the pinks, the purples, the blues, you can't really sit there and say directly that this was inspired by the OMG girls because the OMG girls never trademarked their colors. And yes, you can do that. Crayola has a specific type of green that they trademark. And the very famous Tiffany blue is obviously trademarked. No one can use those specific shades of those colors without paying the price. So yeah, at face value, I knew that they weren't gonna win this case. However, my opinion on the topic at hand has significantly changed. The more that I looked into the court case, followed the court proceedings, and really read up on the history of MGA and other situations that they've been in, it has definitely led me to believe a completely different perspective. 
Now, I want to reiterate again, I am not in the business of trying to convince anyone to feel the same way that I feel. I am not trying to push a narrative and I myself am not a legal counsel, a lawyer or anything of that nature. I am just simply somebody on YouTube that is stating an opinion based off of facts that are provided and that is it, that is all. I am not slandering the MGA company. I am not slandering any of their lines of dolls. I'm, I'm not doing any of that. But I will tell you exactly how I feel. And again, all documents that are needed are linked down below. So you guys can follow along, you can read it up for yourself and come up with your own opinion. I'm not holding anybody back from doing anything. But long story short, the more that time went on and the more that I learned about this court case, I have to say that I am on the side of the OMG girls, Tiny, TI, and the whole grand hustle, pretty hustle community, whatever. So let's just state the obvious. The Mattel company and MGA have been at war for years now and it's low key still going on. Basically, a while back, Mattel had accused MGA of copying Barbie dolls. They are insinuating that brats are a knockoff of the Barbies that Mattel was selling. But when you dive deeper into that court case as well, it's actually a little bit more detailed and a little bit more explanatory. So there was a man named Carl Bryant that actually worked for the Mattel company. And while he was working at the Mattel company, he actually developed the design and the idea of the Bratz dolls. Eventually, Bryant would leave that company and end up going to MGA where he launched that product. So the war between Mattel and MGA really is just off the strength of Mattel feeling like that was their intellectual property that was stolen since technically Bryant did breach his contract and since it was made on company property with the company time and the company resources, Mattel felt like that was their own intellectual property and it was rightfully theirs. Mattel would go on to win their court case, which is why for a moment, the Bratz dolls were discontinued until as of recently. And this wouldn't be the last time that the Bratz dolls in particular were a part of a legal case. The clothing brand Steve Madden at one point in time also sued MGA for copyright infringement, trademark infringement, because they heavily believed that the Bratz dolls were inspired by their early 2000s marketing campaign called Big Head. And this campaign featured predominantly women with very large heads and exaggerated features like very large eyes, small lips, small noses, and very large feet on a very petite frame. Considering that this campaign did come out years before the Bratz dolls were launched, who's to say that they weren't a little bit inspired? Because again, somebody was always inspired by somebody. Somebody got their ideas from somewhere anything is possible. MGA would also go on to be sued by the luxury brand Louis Vuitton for releasing a handbag called Poopy Vuitton that is the resemblance of, you guessed it, poo, and featured the monogram very similar to the classic iconic monogram of the Louis Vuitton. And the real big kicker is that within that same year of the OMG girls and Tiny and TI making a big fuss about the OMG dolls, an influencer named Amina Mucciolo, also known as the Tassel Fairy or Studio Mucci, also pointed out concerns that her likeness was being used in one of their dolls as well, specifically the LOL BB dolls. Amina is also someone who is considered to wear atypical outfits with very loud colors, very prominent, vibrant colors. Her whole entire brand is essentially the rainbow and pastels. One of her main recognizable traits is her multicolor braids that she usually wears every single time you see her and there would come a point in time where she found an lol doll that resembled a lot of her features on june 18th of 2020 amina took to instagram with a post that reads lol surprise created a doll based on my entire image and identity without my permission and i haven't received any acknowledgement or compensation from them in any way in fact they are straight up ignoring me here are the facts Number one, I wore my hair like this and shared the photos on social media from November 2018 to February 2019. In April 2019, LOL Surprise reached out to me and hired me to be a guest on their YouTube channel for a kid's interior design show. Then in July of 2019, they released the Rainbow Raver doll as a part of their hair goals collection and it looks exactly like me. 
I found out about this because I started receiving messages asking me if I knew about the doll and its striking resemblance to me and my unique hair and outfits. Having huge corporations make money off my ideas and identity while I struggle financially as a black freelance artist and content creator has been both infuriating and devastating to say the least. This happened just after I learned I was autistic and I was trying to figure out what that even meant. I didn't really have the space to speak up about the situation publicly. We did reach out to both LOL Surprise and their parent company MGA Entertainment via every channel that was available to us. Not only did they ignore us, but LOL Surprise unfollowed me. This behavior alone is obviously predatory and reprehensible, but the fact that they had the nerve to make a lazy post claiming to care about the injustices done to black people proves that they are also liars. This sort of thing happens to black creatives more than you could possibly imagine and we are tired. Change doesn't happen by posting some stale, vague, insincere corporate BS statement on your Instagram and then going back to business as usual. I'm tired of people like me being forced to speak up and hold these greedy corporations accountable because they refuse to do the work themselves. LOL Surprise, you are not special or inclusive simply because you are keen to make money off of black children and their families. If you really champion inclusivity and actually care about black people, Prove it by making this right and pay me for what you stole. The caption reads, Hi friends, I made a post calling out LOL Surprise's apparent misappropriation of my likeness on June 7th, 2020. Today I am here to report that the post was removed by Instagram. LOL Surprise went around social media filing BS copyright claims regarding the photos I used for the doll to try and silence me. When what I did obviously falls under fair use. But that's okay. I have my own doll and I took a picture myself. I'm sharing this again because I refuse to be silenced by them or anyone else. Since our original post, MGA Entertainment, their parent company, made a very aggressive attempt to contact us and then within the hour before we had a chance to respond, began spreading lies about me and my motivation in bringing this issue to light. Given that they've shown us no reason to trust them, I decided that it would be a bad idea to engage with them without a lawyer. We are currently in the process of hiring one now. If you would like to know how to help or support us, hit the link in my bio. Please share this story. There was also a point in time where MGA would actually be in a legal situation with BMG Rights Management because when they were promoting one of their other doll lines called the Poopsie Slime Surprise, you're asking questions that I don't have the answer to, but trust me, we are all thinking the same thing. I don't know, just go with it. But when they were promoting their new doll line, Poopsie Slime Surprise, they used the rendition of My Humps by Fergie and renamed it My Poops. And they all had the same flow, cadence, insinuation as Fergie's My Humps. What you gonna do with all that poop? Okay, let's move on. Now, let me say this. This is not something that companies don't experience, that companies don't go through. This happens all the time. And if we're being real, this is how majority of companies even make their money to begin with, is by taking people to court for their personal trademarks. Because again, say it with me, y'all. Everybody is inspired by somebody and that somebody was inspired by somebody else. So there will always be conversations and arguments about people feeling as though their ideas or their likeness was being used and misused. So of course, these companies are always gonna go to court. They're always gonna find someone to sue, whether it is a big business, a small business, an individual person, et cetera, et cetera. It's just something that happens that's not out of the ordinary. But I will say for a company to consistently be accused of using other people's products, other people's ideas, and essentially being I guess you could say founded it does raise an eyebrow it definitely does raise a cause of concern because at this point it's like 
when is enough enough you know and the second reason why I feel so strongly about my opinions being changed as well is that the actual court proceedings I understand that when you are in the process of a court case a legal case whatever the whole goal is for the other side to win and they will do anything to win and if you're a fan of how to get away with murder then you already know like you you know you know even when they're wrong they have to do their job like they have to do what they're getting paid to do as lawyers however I will say that when I looked into this court case and I looked at everything that was transcribed I have to say MGA was just unnecessarily aggressive just very unnecessarily aggressive and there was a multitude of times where a lot of the things that they were saying or doing had racial undertones it it definitely had it you know I just wasn't feeling it and of course I'm going to give you the rundown but again if you need to see it for yourself I have everything linked down below so the main point that MGA was trying to drive home was to basically insinuate that the OMG girls were too irrelevant to even want to copy They pointed out that they have no certified plaques, whether that be gold, silver, platinum for any of their songs. They don't have an album, let alone any redeeming musical project, and that they never had their own headlining tour. Now we know these things to be true because again, we've already talked about that. We've touched on that a few times, but to insinuate the relevancy of the OMG girls is definitely something that shows the age gap between the audiences or possibly even the cultural differences between the two. Because we in the black community, we do have black celebrities. Like we have those celebrities where they are very well known in black households. But if you spoke their name in Hollywood, a lot of the Hollywood execs probably wouldn't know who you were talking about. But also keep in mind, like I said before this was a different day age and time the internet was very influential and very powerful at this time so even though they didn't have a main album they didn't have a main record that went gold back in the day the equivalent of going gold or being on the number one billboard charts was being number one on 106 and park I'm telling you right now to go that hard on 106 and park week after week time after time to be in that top five that was an accomplishment and as far as the internet goes to make over a million views on each video that you upload and one of those videos still being a snippet accompanied with a slideshow that is something that a lot of artists can't do and even artists that are signed to big major labels so when we speak about relevancy what exactly are we talking about Are we saying that they're not relevant because they weren't mainstream or are they not relevant because they genuinely are not relevant? And like I said, they wouldn't get their flowers until years later, but the proof is in the pudding. There was clearly a trend. There is clearly a timeline. Initially, I wasn't even gonna include this because I like to make sure that all of my sources are correct. And I only found it on this particular website that you guys are seeing right now and nowhere else. So basically, this is a statement on a website that I will definitely link down below where Tiny states that she actually was in contact with MGA back in 2010 about designing some dolls that modeled after the OMG girls but they could never come to a licensing agreement so the deal fell through. So this is also a piece of evidence that supports the fact that okay you did know who the OMG girls were. So Since this is the only source that I have, technically, why am I talking about it now? It's because as of recently, with the case, it has now been revealed that there were some emails between the members of MGA, between employees of MGA, that were actually discussing the OMG girls and got the OMG girls confused with the OMG dolls. So what relevancy are we exactly talking about? And then the conversation went from the relevancy of the OMG girls to actually insinuating that the OMG girls actually stole from MGA. It wasn't the other way around. MGA is the victim. They have made claims that the OMG girls have replicated a lot of styles that the Bratz dolls had worn once upon a time. So an exact excerpt from the court proceeding says, this case is about greed. That's what it's all about. It's a shakedown. They want tens of millions of dollars from MGA Entertainment for doing absolutely nothing. And I do mean nothing. We're going to show you that the OMG girls actually copied us and now complain we look like them. They were trend followers, not trend setters. 
So another argument that MGA tried to push was that there was no reason to want or need to be inspired by the Harris slash Hustle slash OMG Girls brand. Because since the OMG Girls were heavily tied to the Harris Hustle brands, they just lumped them all in together. So they brought up how T.I. has a lot of songs where he references the N-word. They also pointed out that in Zonique's independent projects, she also uses the N-word a lot. They would also go on to bring up the essay allegations against T.I. and Tiny. I'm pretty sure we all heard about it at this point, and that is still an ongoing investigation and an ongoing court case. So they feel as though the OMG girls are just too violent and too vile for a company that is based in pleasing and promoting themselves to children. Now again, they're affiliating the OMG girl with T.I.'s brand because again, they were signed under one of his labels. I get that, but they literally are sitting here insinuating that the OMG girls are violent and vile. Keep that in mind. And while these things were being talked about, I also wanna highlight that MGA's lawyer Matter of fact, let me say her name. What was her name? Jennifer Keller. Jennifer Keller. When she decided to use this as a defense for MGA, there were a few times where they played songs in court, but there was an incident where Jennifer Keller, this is her, she read the lyrics out loud and included the N-word. Not N-word, the actual word. Spoke it in court. 100%. So when T.I. and Tiny expressed concerns about Miss Keller using the N-word in court, that became a whole separate situation within itself. And she and MGA tried to justify even that. And while we're on the topic of race, there would come a point in time in the trial where they would deem it as a mistrial because according to the judge, the trial was going from trademark infringement to being a racial discrimination case. And the reason being wasn't even because of the N-word. It wasn't even because of the outrage of the N-word being used. It was because a witness went on the stand and accused the brand of cultural appropriation. And from that moment on, it was deemed a mistrial. The witness would also go on to say that they are considering boycotting MGA as a brand. So they automatically decided that they were going to make it a mistrial just off the strength of that because they felt like it was going into deeper waters than what we were here for. Meanwhile, you just allowed a white woman to say the N-word in a courtroom. So, you know. And not to be petty, even though I am, but in all fairness, in this same exact doll line that is being questioned, you do have a doll that is white with micro braids. You know, that's neither here nor there. And this is the last point that I'm making and I'm done, but let's also go back to Amina because when Amina expressed her concerns, the CEO of MGA actually responded and the tweets themselves are actually kind of disgusting. As we read previously, Amina claims that MGA allegedly reported her original post for copyright infringement. So this led her to not only repost the post on Instagram, but on Twitter as well so that more people could see it and she could have better documentation of the situation. This led to the CEO of MGA responding back with his own tweets. The CEO responds back to Amina's tweet saying, you are a disgrace to black people in the Black Lives Matter cause, liar and coward. You are a liar and an extortionist and a fraud. Who is your so-called lawyer? Put his name and contact information here publicly now so we can contact him or her. Now we will no longer be nice and we will sue you for defamation, extortion, fraud, etc. Watch. Those who use Black Lives Matter to profit and defraud for personal gains harm the cause at Studio Mucci. Shameful fraud. So in MGA's initial apology, they would provide their own personal timeline of events of how the doll came to be. And they would also acknowledge that they did an internal investigation and found out that the doll in question was actually designed by one of their black designers. This black designer would also go on to give Amina a piece of their mind. 
The designer came into Amina's comments and said, you are a beautiful woman inside and out, but I'm telling you the truth with all my heart and knowledge. Rainbow Raver was not designed after your likeness. I am a black creative and one of the designers of the LOL surprise. I know it's a lot putting myself out like this, but I just want you to understand the truth. We designed dolls of all skin tones and Rainbow Raver could have easily been tan or white. There are so many details on our doll that don't match what you say is you. I want you to understand that no designer at MGA is a bitter, or maybe it's supposed to say bitter, we do not steal from black creatives or any creatives. We are also creatives. One love. And sometime after this, Amina would go on to block the designer, which led to the designer making her own initial post again, and this time she wasn't really all that nice about it. The post reads, Studio Moochie, you've deleted every post I've sent you last week and blocked me. You replied to everyone who supports your ignorance but refused to respond to me, a black woman, a black creative. You have made it clear by your actions that the truth doesn't matter. You will lose fighting against a child of God. No creative at MGA copies or steals from any black creatives or any other creative. There are black creatives at MGA and we inspire everyone around us. It's unfortunate you don't see Rainbow Raver's artistic expression created five months before you created your look from another black creative, but you are able to appreciate and applaud kindred creativity from a humanoid perspective based off your post. Rainbow Raver is not you or your likeness, period. She was drawn and rendered for production in the summer of 2018. Your look was posted in November 2018. If anything, you stole from the creatives at LOL Surprise. I'm deeply offended. I design LOL Surprise dolls with all my heart and soul, and I will not allow you to spread lies that the black, brown, yellow, and white creatives at MGA are plagiarist. The designer then would make a separate post showcasing pictures of Amina and her partner together, as well as their LinkedIn page, and caption it, did a little research myself. Looks like her hubby, Mr. Studio Moochie, are the fingers behind the screen, behind the lies, and the blank who blocked me. Hashtag exposed. So firstly, I want to identify that Amina's partner has transitioned since this situation and they go by she, her pronouns. But besides that point, the main point, which is why we're having this conversation, I'm assuming that the post was made to insinuate that Amina's partner was the one that was trying to stir up and cause a controversy for profit. But I'm also getting the impression that what's trying to be said is that Amina is less black because her partner is white. I, I don't really know what the, the point of that was. Like, I'm not really 100% clear of what that research was supposed to do. But yeah, that, that was the response from the designer. So yeah, my whole entire synopsis, my whole entire personal opinion about this situation is that I feel like this is a prime case of a hit dog hollering. This is a prime case of a hit dog hollering. And I'm going to tell you why. Again, personal opinion, don't care what you do with the information. I don't think MGA had any idea how truly influential the OMG girls were. And I don't think they had any idea of just how powerful TI and Tiny were. Because again, the black community, we have what is deemed a black celebrity. Maybe in the eyes of mainstream media, T.I. isn't that big of a deal. Maybe in the eyes of mainstream media, Tiny and escaping them ain't that big of a deal. So maybe it was a situation where they thought no one was going to notice. A lot of people noticed. A lot of people had opinions. And once Tiny and the other members of the OMG girls had posted their own proof on their pages, asking for a public opinion, not even fully insinuating, hey, this is what's going on. They were asking for a public opinion and they seen the outpour of people that seen those similarities and had those same opinions, they came to court unprepared. Simple as that. It, it seems like that's exactly what was going on. They did not expect for this to go as far as it did. And for all we know, I don't think they thought that T.I. and Tiny had money. I don't think they had money because the insinuation of, oh, they're doing it for 
the coin. They're doing it because they just want the money. It, they, it's based off of greed. Tiny? Tiny needs money? Tiny needs money. Tamika Tiny Harris needs money. Tamika Tiny Cottle Harris needs money. T.I. Clifford Harris needs money. The people that have music careers, songwriting credentials, and how many reality shows need the money from a doll maker. I don't even know how that makes sense. I, I don't even I don't even understand how they came to that conclusion. And that would also explain why there were so many situations. Like, again, you can read the documents if you want to read the documents. There were so many holdups in this whole entire trial. We essentially were going to court for a yes or no question. And they had two mistrials. So one of them was the racial insensitivity, the cultural appropriation accusation. And another mistrial was that the CEO apparently went to another court proceeding while that court proceeding was in action. Then there was a point in time where one of the people on the jury went to the bathroom and just magically was missing a shoe. And the court got held up because this girl is missing a shoe. What? It was literally just hectic for no reason. It was hectic for no reason. They were being so mean and aggressive for no reason. And like I said, this is something that happens in court. This is something that happens when you go on trial. But when I tell you it was just, it was unnecessary and it was overly aggressive. And mind you, from a legal standpoint, there are other people that are legal reporters and lawyers that have looked at this case and were just like, where is this coming from why are they behaving this way like what is the point of them doing all of this so it's not just me not being able to take you know the heat or I'm playing favorites and being biased towards the OMG girls no everyone is kind of on the same accord of what is going on because this is just unnecessary and I'm gonna read off some of the tweets that Megan Cunniff had just to prove that I'm, I'm not the one tripping so on May 25th 2023 Megan would go on Twitter to tweet this is the most vicious trial I've ever covered, maybe ever in terms of how mean the attorneys are, one side only. And it's frankly just a bummer, has made covering it a lot more tiresome than it should be. But I'll have another article on this battle probably tonight, stay tuned. Judge Selena just now, I think collectively the parties are beginning to test the patience of this jury. That's judge speak for please, for the love of God, stop with this damn doll trial. We are all sick of it. Another tweet would read, a lawyer for MGA Entertainment got in my face when I was trying to walk into the courtroom and hissed, really? After she saw me chatting with T.I. and his PR flack the other day. So needless to say, I am looking forward to this trial ending and everyone getting out of my courtroom please and as i've told you guys in previous installments of the what happened to series when you see me come on camera bare face with my bonnet on it's because it's been major developments being made so number one the omg girls are going back to court this upcoming september they have not given up the fight they are going to prove their points number two again it's giving a hit dog is going to holler so i regret everything that i did in the past when i was recording this video i know you guys don't care but i'm gonna show you proof of how long ago i researched for this video so this which i will also put on the screen is a screenshot from the way back machine and it is a screenshot of the omg girls old youtube page and this screenshot was taken september 10th i have been doing research for this video since september and i got done with this script in probably like what early january and when i was doing research for this particular topic for this script for this court case i remember going on the mga official site and they had descriptions for each collection that they had of their dolls and there was a very lengthy description for the omg dolls magically today there is no description it's only the product nothing more nothing less so this is an example of what I'm talking about. I am currently on the MGA's website, the official website. And on this website, you can click on the brands and it will pull up all of the brands that MGA owns or has ownership of currently. And you go on any of these little pages, they will take you to a new website. And 
it's essentially like their own page but also their own website for each of these toys and they have so many details like rainbow high you get to have all these these youtube videos and there's a segment where you get to see each and every one of the dolls what their names are their hobbies etc etc but for some reason when we get to lol they don't have that they used to have it they used to have it. I remember it very clear because their theme was like hot pink and white. They don't have it anymore. And even if you go on things like the Bratz page or even their newest dolls, the Mermaids, I believe that's how they're pronounced. Everyone has a very detailed and interactive page. But when you go to the LOL site, it's literally just the products. It's just the products. It did not originally look like this. And y'all, I swear, I even tried to go on the Wayback Machine. It doesn't even turn up on the Wayback Machine. They completely got rid of it. They completely got rid of it. It's just like, why, why would you feel the need to do that? That's what I'm saying. Like, something about this just isn't sitting well with me. And I understand that these dolls, they're collectibles for the most part. And every other year or every other six months, they push out a new collection. Totally get that, totally understand that because it's a franchise and it's a toy company. But I also noticed that a significant amount of the dolls that were being used in the court proceedings, they're not on sale anymore. There's some but there's a large majority of them that are not available anymore. Not to mention that some of their newer dolls look like some of the old dolls that were a part of the court case, but they're like recolored. And again, toy companies do this. Sometimes they use the same shell, the same face, the same concept. But all I'm saying is this is a very new line. This is a very new line of dolls. Isn't it kind of too soon to be doing that? So yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But again, my personal opinion my personal opinion you guys can look at the information for yourself and make your own determination and that's all i have to say and all in all the point that i'm trying to make at the end of the day which is why i mentioned this court case which is why i mentioned the history of this toy company and so on and so forth the omg girls were very influential even from the very beginning of their careers even when they thought they didn't have a career to have okay Unfortunately, no one saw the vision and no one really was able to give them their credit and give them their flowers in real time because of the social programming that we had at this particular time period. I really want to say it was like a little bit after we signed to Interscope. That's when we was like, all right, we're going to dye our hair like all pink all blue all purple and that shit just kind of went crazy like yeah. we i don't really think like i remember on the internet everybody's like oh my god they're so ghetto yeah i was how, yep, how i was going their there parents letting them do this their hair is gonna fall out like it was just so much typically from like you know like i would say like women who look like us of color yeah, not yeah for sure. but you know I go think, there let's go there i think too like it was just something that people had never seen before and i think that we kind of gave like young girls and really women period young women period the confidence because it's not like we're the first to wear colored hair i just think that in this era we were the first girls to give like other black women that confidence you know what i mean like i guess for like the older women who were commenting on it at that time i don't think they really understood it and now we've seen this kind of resurgence of like women doing like pink blue purple red green neon gray like all these different colors Burgundy for and sure like, red, yeah, red is big red yeah, is huge, yeah like i mean and i but i love to see it though because i feel like it's it's expressing yourself you know what i mean like we could wear colored hair too. You know, I feel like for so long, black women, we've been put in this box. Oh, we got to wear our hair like this. We got to look like this. Your hair can't be too curly or kinky or anything like that. And I just feel like as black women, we could do what the fuck we want to do. Like, Well, I don't know we're not in that culture, but we don't see uh, girls with fair skin or white girls or um, girls who aren't of color yeah. get the same sl uh, slack that black women get when they wear Absolutely wigs. not. And especially young 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 like white girls um you know so i think when we came and we did that it was kind of like almost like a culture shock you mm -hmm. know like i remember if shade room wasn't around yet it was like media takeout was like the big blog and on media takeout they like crucified us Ugh, i was devastated i'm like oh my gosh i hate this people have all this stuff to say i think like who says that like color hair is not professional though mm -hmm. them 
You know what I mean? Like, no. Like, I think we should just be allowed to be who we want to be. Because if we see someone who's not my color, you know what I mean? And she might have a blue streak or a pink streak or whatever's in her hair. Like, it's not deemed unprofessional mm -hmm. until it's seen on a black woman. Damn. or until it's seen on a black person and you know for me like i'm not really too like you know like oh like white black you know whatever but i do feel like in certain instances like that like i've been into several meetings i done sat at jimmy Iovine house with my hair all pink mm. and got a record deal you know what i mean so in this industry we're told that we have to look polished we can't come out the house looking any type of way we have to always be on point i think what we did was just different and I don't really feel like it's anybody's responsibility to deem it professional or not. Like, I feel like being unprofessional, in my opinion, is like showing up and not doing what you're supposed to be doing or half assing your job. Mm. Like, if I'm doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing at my job, does it matter what color my hair is? Mm. Or does it matter how my hair looks? It's acceptable because y'all see like potential here and money here and y'all see an avenue to eat, right? But it's not acceptable if I'm just a regular black girl working a nine to five if i come in here with a head full of pink hair it's good. you know what i mean i don't think that's fair and due to the fact that they were not given that proper credit they were not given that proper chance they were not really highly treated and respected as such icons that they were and currently are that gave a company ammunition to not only try to humble them and downplay their role in the lives of literally millions of people, but also used it as a justification as far as like, well, if we wanted to steal from you, we could. You know, we always gonna stand up and we gonna fight for our creativity and our right. And at the end of the day, and it's like, I'm, I'm glad that we here and we could kind of touch on this because I think a lot of people in the comments and stuff like that didn't really understand, you know what I mean, why we felt this way. It's like, this corporation has a history of doing this to young black creatives. It's not just us. This corporation it's, meaning um the MG. MGA. MGA. Mm -hmm. They that, have a... Wait, we got to break it down even more. Yeah. Who does? The Bratz. The they do the Bratz dolls. Okay, because yeah. even me, I'm just, I'm yeah. trying to learn. Yeah. So they do the Bratz dolls. They do the LOL OMG dolls, mm -hmm. which is what we were saying. They were infringing upon our trademark and our image and our likeness. But, you know, it's like this company, this is what they do to black creatives. And then they go to white creatives and they do partnership deals and they make sure they go about it the right way way there mm. but when it comes to us it's like we have to fight you know what i'm saying for our for really just our creative right and ideas that we came up with our moms came up with mm -hmm. and you know i think that they probably felt we didn't have the resources or we didn't have the know-how or any type of backing to really well, y'all yeah, have yeah. i don't think yeah. that they really did did the research no. <laughs> and, Stop it. And, you know it, it just it was a crazy experience you mm -hmm. know that i think that mm -hmm. was the first time that we had ever been up against anything like that ever in mm -hmm. our lives so you know? when it came out was that like clear like bro that's us bro like what are y'all doing mm -hmm. For yeah, us, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. most definitely and it was in different ways how they put it together how they like packaged it together mm -hmm. how they even had them like go on tours and do music videos and all those type of things on youtube too so they were like artists and everything yeah. so it was the pink purple and blue the colored hair even how they positioned the dolls like how we were standing our pink purple and blue like for posing for pictures on red carpet mm -hmm. it was just crazy and, and even then, for little kids to be like yeah. they would think that you know that's was, what's uh, the thing right confusing. it's the confusion right yeah, and that was the part confused. yeah they didn't know y'all got a lot of backlash for stuff like that we talked about it in yeah, the beginning right, right? Yeah. like when mm -hmm. y'all changing and hairs and people thing. talking about but they're yeah. promoting these dolls and to our community you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. to people who look like us and that's why like even too in the comments it was irritating me just seeing people who look like us being like oh those dolls don't look like them they're tripping da 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 da, da. it's like if y'all really could have sat in there and seeing how these people were attacking our characters, mm -hmm. how they were attacking our families, our accomplishments, mm -hmm. what we have done, haven't done. It was sick. And it's like, I mean, to me, it was sick. I it just was. felt like oh, it, yeah, it, no, was it was really was sick. And I think that, like, you know, that's all the more reason that we always going to fight for what we believe is rightfully ours. Because, like, that was something that I feel like we had to fight back on the street. Yeah, period. especially I want to make sure to know, like, they are called the LOL, but they're, they're called the LOL OMG doll. So mm -hmm. even the name being OMG, how it is, and it's outrageous millennial girls, and we were known as officially misguided, but, like, even how they pitch it to be, like, big sisters and all that type of thing for girls or whatever like that, like, that's our whole pitch that we've done since we were out as a group. Like, the fans always looked at us as not big sisters, like, best friends that they can come to and, yeah. like, relate to and feel like they can, you know, hear some music that they 
you know, they can vibe with and all those type of things. So for them to even be called OMG, like, that was right there, like, crazy in itself. So it's really unfortunate that they had to face majority of the issues that they had to go through at such a young age. But I feel like I speak on behalf of majority of people when I say that we are very thankful for the OMG girls taking that leap of faith and breaking the status quo and breaking those standards so that we can be where we are today and be a little bit more comfortable in how we express ourselves. So the next hurdle that the OMG girls would have to face, I would say it definitely had to do with the lack of engagement from Zanique and Brianna, but as well as the over engagement of Beja. So as I've already stated before, social media played a huge role during the 2010s. And it's fair to say that the 2010s was all about parasocial relationships, basically. It was now accessible for everyday people to be able to reach out and talk to their favorite celebrities and their favorite music artists. We as a society would come together and we would live tweet about a show that we're watching or a movie that was coming out and even the actors themselves would be able to interact with us as well. And in some cases, if you got enough attention from a certain celebrity, you basically got to be a part of their entourage and possibly even mess around and marry some. Like, crazy things happened after that. So with this being the new norm, your presence on social media and being able to interact with a lot of your fan base was just as detrimental and important to your career as anything else. And this is where the OMG girls kind of sort of had a problem. So, again, in their prime, there was Brianna, there was Zanique, and there was Beja. Brie and Zanique were not that active on social media. They were not really all that present. We would see Zanique more than we would see Brianna, though. But both of them had their fair share of just posting, like, a selfie, and then you just never see them again. And that was, that was just it. That was just it. If it wasn't OMG Girl related, we was not hearing from them. Simple as that. Now for Zonique, it was actually, to a degree, she, she had a reason as to why she was so aloof and why she pretty much was private and kept things to herself. Because like we've said before, the OMG Girls were featured on two reality shows at this point. And obviously with Zonique being the child of one of the main characters, she got a lot of spotlight on her. Once the Tiny and Toya show had ended and there was now a T.I. and Tiny Family Hustle show, which showcased the family dynamic between T.I., Tiny, and their children, biologically, stepchildren, etc., etc., Zanique became basically one of the main cast members. So from the time that she was about 11 or 12, possibly 13, she has had an eye on her from the very beginning. She is the child of two very famous people. Even though T.I. is her stepdad, they claim each other as family either way. So she's always in the spotlight. She's always somebody that gets a lot of attention. She's always somebody that has an eye on her. And she just developed an anxiety where she knew that if she said the wrong thing, did the wrong thing, she would be criticized. Her mother was heavily criticized multiple times throughout her time of being in the spotlight. When she was in a girl group, when she was just a reality TV show star, she always got something. Mm -hmm. When it comes to being the child of superstar parents, mm -hmm. first thing that comes to your mind? <clears throat> Annoying. Mm. Um, well, we, like a weird pressure. Mm. Mm, not what people expect for it to be. Jeez. Mm -hmm. People think it's just like, oh, it's the perfect life that you could ever ask for. Why are you like this? Or why are you complaining? Like, you grew up behind a picket fence, but it's just... Like, people... I don't know. Like, more money, more problems. People scream that all the time, but I don't think you really understand that unless it's, like, the, the life you live. Mm. So, I don't know. It's like, you have... I don't know. It's misunderstood. I feel like in this world we are in today, not that you can, I don't really believe in like cancel culture, but I feel like it's easier for people to like start this hate train on you. Okay. Type this thing. is true. Yeah. So now we're in a world where it's kind of like you feel like you would want to kind of be a little more okay. careful about the things yeah. you say because 
people love to jump on this whole bandwagon of like, you know. So seeing that and understanding that, it's not shocking that Zonique pretty much retreated into herself and doesn't really talk to that many people. And I'm gonna be real, I'm gonna be honest, I'm gonna be honest, as a fellow Pisces, cause we, we are both Pisces, I'm gonna be real, okay? If it wasn't for me being on YouTube, I probably would not be present on the internet right now. Because fun fact about me, not a fun fact for people that have already subscribed to my channel, but like I was never a big social media person. I was a late bloomer when it came to presenting yourself on social media. So I, I can't even lie to you, can't even fret. I would not actively choose to be in the center of attention. I would not sit here and be actively posting, talking to people. Like I pretty much just have an account just so I can stay in the know of different things, but I wouldn't actively be like, hey, I'm an influencer. You know, like if, if it wasn't for all of this, I wouldn't be doing this. And it's kind of funny because it's like, girl, why you, why you on YouTube then? But I don't know, that's just me. But it, I don't know, it's just something about us being like real reclusive, like naturally, like people just always think that we're mysterious or we're being sneaky or we have something to hide or something of that nature. Like they always think that something is going on, something or other is going on when in reality, we ain't doing nothing. We ain't doing nothing, we just, we chilling. Like I didn't know that you wanted to know what I ate today. I didn't know that I was supposed to take you in the bathroom with me. I, I didn't know that so you know like not to pull the astrology card but you know I get it I get it now as far as Brie goes I don't really know what her situation is but as far as I can remember Brie has never been a social media type person like she ain't never did social media I mean even the way that the OMG girls discovered her her uncle put her on basically her uncle fun fact if you didn't know her uncle is actually the bodyguard of the OMG girls. So her uncle pretty much showed them a tape of her dancing. And it was like, okay, have her audition. And that was it. She, she, she don't do this social media stuff, you know? So with them two, they weren't really the types that would be like out. They weren't the types that would be, you know, like all attention, all eyes on me, et cetera, et cetera. Like they, they weren't those types of people, right? Beja, however, Beja was very charismatic very outgoing and was usually the main one that would talk during majority of the interviews and answer a lot of questions she was the one that was a little bit more consistently present on the internet she was the one that was predominantly you know out there as opposed to the other members of the group and what's crazy is, is that similar to Zonique, you know, she also comes from someone who was very big and very famous in the music industry. So to reiterate, she is the child of Jonathan Rasboro from the group Silk. And not to tell her business or nothing, but like from what I understand, her and her dad don't have like a really close knit relationship. So I guess because of that, she's never had to worry about being in the spotlight. She's never had to worry about people sitting up talking about her or anything like that. So she's had no fears about popping out, posting pictures, making tweets, et cetera, et cetera, because I guess in her head, she's like, oh, I'm just a regular person. Like, I'm not a Nepo baby. Like I am technically, but like, I don't really see myself as such. So she had way more freedom mentally than Zonique. But unfortunately, due to the fact that Zonique and Brianna were not as present, not as active on social media, that left majority of the heavy work with Beja. Meanwhile, she's not the only person in the group. So why does she have all of that responsibility? But I digress. That's just how the cookie crumbles. That was just how it was. Yeah. And we like to talk, especially me. Beja <laughs> love to talk. Um, nah, this is vibe. Don't, don't be her like, like that, bro. No, no, no. no. She said, she just like, said, I'm, I'm the most talkative. <laughs> no, literally, like, when we used to do interviews, she I'm not going to lie. Like, I'll probably talk the I ain't going to do that. I was talk. Because she was chatty patty, Yeah, I know, but I don't have... And that's when, when you was like, what's she the difference? She was difficult? chatty patty. <laughs> Let me just say, when you was like, hold up, chatty patty is really crazy. <laughs> um, but... 
when you was like, oh, what's the difficult part of being a group? I was going to say, I feel like it's for me, for sure, it's easier because like it's three of us. Mm -hmm. I don't have to do much. I can come in here like, oh, it's an interview. And I can sit right here and be mute. And <laughs> if they oh, answer the questions, know. it's yeah, it's more right. of the group. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. It's much easier for yeah. me. Like, Facts. I, I yeah. So even though this is like somewhat of a good thing because everybody kind of like fed where each other lacked, this also would surprisingly and ironically prove as also being one of the issues that was holding the group back. So with her being the more outgoing one, she also was the one that was a little bit more outspoken. So she had no problem addressing rumors. Any hate that was targeted towards the OMG girls, she was going to be the first one to speak out. And was she going to necessarily be the nicest? No. Was she going to be the most politically correct? No. She was going to say exactly how she felt. And you also have to factor in the fact that, you know, again, her and Zanique, they grew up together. That's basically her cousin. So that's her family on top of that. She wasn't going for none of that. She wasn't about to go for none of that. So I personally feel like there is nothing wrong with defending yourself. There is nothing wrong with standing up for yourself and, you know, standing up for the people that you love. But there is a limit. And it seems as though Beja never knew what that limit was was nor did she care nor did she care because there would be times where it's just like baby this would die down way quicker if everybody was quiet this would be a little bit calmer if you would have just said that one little thing and kept it pushing because the more she talked the more she talked the messier situations got and of course i have a few examples for y'all Okay, so Miss Beja cleaned her Twitter. The whole year of 2012 does not exist on her Twitter. So I, I tried to pull these things up so that I could show y'all because I love having evidence. I love having proof. But this is the segment where you're just going to have to take my word for it because I can't pull nothing up. So understand that what I'm about to tell y'all, it's literally off the top of the dome because I cannot give y'all like an exact exact timeline i i have no video evidence no photo evidence no nothing for y'all y'all just gotta y'all just gotta trust me okay but if you remember these events please comment them down below that way everybody knows like i'm not just making this up and if you do have your own evidence i mean i can't use it now obviously but like i guess you could post it somewhere i don't know <laughs> i don't know but like yeah so anyways so the first incident that I want to talk about is the infamous BET pre-show. So as I stated previously, one of the critiques that the OMG girls got a lot was their capabilities to perform live. Nobody disregarded their abilities as far as like their dance moves, but when it came to their physical appearance, their hairstyles, and being able to perform live, that was the thing that a lot of people had qualms about because again, there were a lot of hit or miss performances from the omg girls it, it was so during this time i think they were going real real hard on the omg girls because if i can remember correctly this was around the time that it was announced that the omg girls would be going on the second scream tour and this time they weren't opening acts i think they were like one of the main acts they weren't headlining I forget who was headlining that year, but they were one of the big acts, which means that they had more time and space to do like costume changes and stuff of that nature. And around this time, they had released more music on top of that as well. So, you know, like there was more eyes on OMG than what it was before. And since there was more eyes, unfortunately, there would be more haters. So these haters gave them a lot of flack for not being able to perform live. They had a lot of opinions about, okay, well, what are these girls going to do on the Scream Tour? Because the last Scream Tour, you know, we weren't really all that impressed, you know. And Miss Beauty, the, the lovely, lovely Miss Beauty, you know, she didn't take these allegations lying down. She wasn't a fan of it. So this would be the time period where you would start to see her just randomly upload covers of herself singing different songs. And not only was she uploading covers herself, but a lot of the big dedicated fans of the OMG girls would also somehow find like some of their older videos and upload them on YouTube as well, showing that the girls can sing and they can sing a cappella. But of course, you know, haters gonna hate. So it still was not good enough for majority of the people that already decided that they did not like the OMG girls. So again, Beauty had her moments with a few of them where they're going back and forth on Twitter. She's like, you know, going up about how 
I want to see you on stage. I want to see how you perform. When you get on a tour, you call me and let me know. Da 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 da. Like she's just, you know, going back and forth with a lot of these trolls. And not only that, like I had said previously as well, majority of their content that they would upload, it would be them on a regular day. It would be them being normal teenage girls. You didn't really get the whole pictures and videos of them at soundcheck. You didn't really get the whole like, hey, this is us at practice. This is us at rehearsal. You, you didn't really get that type of content. During this time is when we would see a lot of that content. Now we do have pictures and videos of these girls going to practice consistently. Now we have live tweeting of them being in vocal classes. Like now we're, we're you know, like it, it's being broadcasted now that they're working hard. They have a point to prove now, apparently. And this was all leading up to this BET pre-show because on top of them being criticized for not being able to perform vocally, there were a lot of people that were also cracking jokes about how the OMG girls weren't even good enough to come in the building. It was crazy. But yeah, there was a lot of criticism and critique during this time. Like this was when it was probably the heaviest. So the hype was being built up to this pre-show. They they kept hyping this pre-show up. They kept talking about it. They kept tweeting about it. We kept seeing pictures and videos of rehearsal. We just kept seeing more and more and more. Like they just would not be quiet about this pre-show. And when they get to the pre-show, it was quite literally the worst performance they have ever done in their whole entire careers. The worst basically what it was was that it was believed that they were going to have a pre-recorded track as they were performing at this pre-show but at some point i guess at the last minute they were notified that they would have to be singing completely live they only had the instrumental they only had the beat but keep in mind they formed this whole entire performance around the fact that these vocals were already pre-recorded. So a lot of the choreography that they were doing, it was supposed to be this big, vibrant, energetic performance just because they wanted to get everybody's attention. Because again, it's only the pre-show. It's only the pre-show. Everyone is not going to the pre-show. Majority of people are going to the main event. The pre-show is essentially something to hold you over until they open up the doors. So for them, the actual performance aspect of the performance was really important. Not to mention, they're outside. Acoustics outside, it's not really all that. And plus, I also just want to highlight, like, pre-recorded live performances are nothing new. Like, Pre-recorded vocals for live performances is, is not a new concept. They actually do that a lot. Some of your faves have done that a lot because it's not the fact that these people can't perform. It's just that these award shows want everything to be perfect. So there's a lot of artists that have done pre-recordings of their vocals and performed live, half and half live. And it's mainly because there might be a point in time where they might not hit a note as good or they might fumble around here or whatever and they want it to flow as smooth as possible so it's still live but technically yes but technically no but for some reason they just decided last minute that they weren't gonna give the omg girls those pre-recorded vocals so while they're doing this energetic whole entire routine they're not hitting notes like they're supposed to they're out of breath and i have to say like from what i can remember i remember that there was a point in time where like i think when 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 Beja started singing, the mic was going in and out. So like the mics low key weren't working. And I remember it was kind of going in and out for Baby Doll as well. So it was also just like production in general just kind of set them up for failure. And the video that I do have of this performance is like recorded off of somebody's TV. So it's not clear. So that's another reason why I'm like, I can't tell if that's what happened or if it's like this person's TV or their phone or what. But I do remember in real time, like I remember it sound like that mic was going in and out in and out but it could have just been the fact that maybe they weren't holding the mic close enough I, I don't know but either way when it was all said and done after talking all that mess on Twitter this was so embarrassing for the OMG girls like it was absolutely embarrassing for the OMG girls because they really went hard well not they beja <laughs> beja went really hard trying to convince people that they were not mediocre and that they can sing in real life and for that to be the performance after months of talking crazy on twitter and literally getting into it so bad with trolls that was so 
humiliating. That was embarrassing. And the second incident that I want to highlight, it's more so not an incident, but like a series of incidences. But to make a long story short, when Beja would go back and forth with these trolls a lot, there came a point in time where she actually had physical violence be threatened on her to the point where her parents had to call for extra security and call the police and possibly, I think, press charges or like tell them to keep a lookout for the girls or something of that nature it was a video I forget if it was a vine or a keek but I, I just remember that I remember that and for some reason they had to call somebody and they were just like yeah we're not playing around you're not gonna touch my daughter da 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 and the thing about it is that like I personally I don't feel like anything that Beja said or did warranted people trying to physically harm her or put hands on her but the thing that killed me about Beja is that like this all could have been avoided because why are you sitting here arguing with people on the internet like what are you actually doing again I don't believe that you shouldn't defend yourself but you are quite literally arguing with people that are clearly too dedicated to being this this entity on the internet like you should never be arguing with people that are clearly unhinged like that's just not it and now that it's gotten to a point to where violence is being threatened on you your parents are worried like that should make you be worried that should make you be like okay I'm gonna stop I'm gonna tone it down girl no girl no 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 it didn't no it didn't that did not stop this girl from doing Nathan Nathan at all she never stopped never and then I found this interview through revolt where Beja is talking about an experience that she had with one of the trolls and one of the trolls was like a Diggy Simmons fan page and she met that troll at the Diggy Simmons tour the Jet Setters tour because they were also opening acts for that tour as well and Beja basically walked up to the girl and checked her and said didn't you say that you wanted to fight me and I oh and and mind you this this was after your parents had to call some people to make sure that you didn't get jumped what are we doing like what are we doing because the thing is is that like yes given majority of this flack is going towards beja like they're still going towards the omg girls but majority of the the threats and stuff are going predominantly towards beja but let's be real you are a part of a group you are also putting the girls in danger you are putting the girls in jeopardy as well and i believe at this time i believe that their manager tamra was still pregnant it was 2012 so was she pregnant in 2011 or 2012 i don't fully remember i remember she did have the baby like shortly after one of their tours though but I'm again it's off the dome I don't fully remember everything but yeah even with that it's like you are putting so many people in danger by playing in people's faces like this this is not the way to do it this is not the route to go down and again it's like you are giving so much negative attention to the OMG girls like you cannot be doing stuff like that I ain't gonna lie they used to be on my ass like but you know me I was always the one who was gonna talk shit like you know that about me Princess. Mm -hmm. like you know Damn. i was going to say something like i couldn't I help it i really used to be trolling you said what i said every time you did not care no i didn't care and you know it used to be so funny like i feel like back then like well our team and stuff they used to be wanting me like michael martin shit he used to be wanting me to like not be on twitter going back and forth for all that stuff i'm like fuck <laughs> that shit i'm saying something i don't care they not gonna be trying me they would say eddie and everything to anybody and then i just also feel like with the hair colors and and the outfits you already had people going out of their way calling y'all ghetto this gives ghetto this gives ghetto babe and again i'm not against you defending yourself I'm not against that at all, but you gotta, you gotta think a little smarter. You, you can't be doing stuff like that, bro. So all in all, it's like these things are just really terrible looks for the OMG girls, even though I know it was coming from a good place. This is a terrible look and a lot of these things were terrible ideas.
And it's like, if it would have stayed at just OMG girl drama or OMG girl hate, even then I would have been a little bit more lax about it. It would have been like, mm, okay, like I see that. I get that. I understand that. But again, Beja was very outspoken and she did not have a limit. So this limit also included other people business. It did. It included multiple other people business. If she seen you as a friend, a brother, a sister, a cousin, whatever, she was going to hop in your mess. She was going to speak her piece and it was just going to be that. And you couldn't tell her otherwise. So to give you an example, Rock Royal is a member from the group Mindless Behavior that was also coming up at that same time. Rock Royal to her was like her brother. All of the members of Mindless Behavior were basically her brothers. That's how she interpreted it. So Rock Royal at the time was dating a girl named Desiree. At this time, Mindless Behavior was very big. They were very big and they were very major. But with them being so big and so major, obviously the labels wanted them to present themselves as these young boys that were very single. So of course he couldn't be completely open with his relationship, but being a part of Team Mindless previously, we all were aware that this is your girlfriend. Because the thing about it is that Rock might have been hiding it. Desiree was not. Desiree ain't never had it. She was very vocal about it. She was very open about it. And she, she broadcasted it as much as she possibly could. And the thing is, is that Desiree is not the first, let alone the only girl that Rock Royal has dated during his career. But with the other girls that people were aware of or had a hunch about, they were at least a little bit discreet with it. They were a little bit, you know, keep it on the low, no pun intended. They were keeping it on the low. Whereas with Desiree, it was like she was purposely rubbing it in people's faces. Like she was being, you know, just bold and out there with it. So there would come a point in time where it was assumed that Rock Royal and Desiree had broke up because basically they started subtweeting each other. You know, the little heartbroken teenage situation. They started subtweeting each other. They heard, they mad at each other, whatever, whoop de woo. So there would come a point in time where Desiree had posted a tweet. I don't really remember what the tweet had said, but the, the tweet itself was direct it was very direct and it was a diss towards rock royal so when she tweeted that when she said that beja took it upon herself to make her own tweet and the tweet said rock royals exes unite girl why would you do that why would you do that why would you why would you sit there and do that and the thing that made the tweet as shady as it was and as funny as it was at the time it's the fact of the matter that again he had dated multiple girls that's what he was known for we, we as as a fan base we all knew who his girlfriends were at certain intervals of time without them really saying it but not only that it was rumored that beja and rock royal had a thing at some point in time so it was even funnier because if you understood the lore it seemed as if she was rallying the other girls to go against Desiree together. So it, it just, it was messy. It looked crazy. It was messy. But I do remember that night I was very entertained. I thought it was hilarious, but it was still messy. She shouldn't have did that. Now, at first, it seemed like Desiree got the joke. It seemed like she, you know, was kicking with Beja right along with her. They seemed like everything was perfectly fine. But apparently apparently it was some issues that were unbeknownst to the audience behind the scenes so from what we can gather from what we can understand desiree was very possessive over her relationship with rock royal so possessive that she did not want that man to have any female friends or any affiliation with anybody and obviously beja was one of those close friends that happened to be female so allegedly I can't prove it, but it's been talked about. Allegedly, Desiree at some point hacked into Rock Royal's Twitter and unfollowed every girl that she seen on his page. Famous, fan, didn't matter. She unfollowed every single girl that that man followed. And of course, Beja was one of them. So it can be assumed that maybe it was because of that situation being known between the two of them that the tweet itself did rub Desiree the wrong way 
So even though initially she laughed at it, initially it was a joke, initially it was no harm, no foul, eventually, I guess it hit Desiree, she got offended and was really pissed off about it. So the next thing you know, Desiree starts subtweeting. And it's just very clear to the audience, to everyone else that was paying attention, that it was definitely targeted towards Beja. So once Beja had caught wind of it, she then went on pretty much a Twitter tirade. And now it is just like a gigantic big argument between her and Desiree. This is when Beja would go on to tweet, bro, I'm his sister. I stay around forever. I don't know what you are, but whatever that is, you'll be replaced in a few months. So enjoy this. Never forget your role. Know it, learn it, and stay there. And that is when everything went up in flames, ladies and gentlemen. That, that was the moment that everything went left. So on the aspect of Rock Royal, that was a bad move because not only did you kind of sort of put his business out there but you also just confirmed all of his alleged relationships now again it was alleged all the other times we had a very large hankering about him and Desiree because Desiree was never hiding the fact that she was with him but Rock was still denying that relationship he was still hiding her he was still doing damage control for the sake of his career you saying that just because you were upset could have done some damage to his image and his career. But we didn't think about that because in the moment we was just mad and we just wanted to get our stuff off. Understood, right? But still, that was not a smart move. So because that situation happened, Rock's biological sister named Priya had to hop into it and she's trying to defend her brother because she felt like Beja didn't have to do all that and she was being disrespectful. So now Beja and Priya are getting into it badly. Mind you, th this is Rock's biological sister. Not the sister from tour, not a sister on a stage, no, his biological sister. And she is now openly beefing on Twitter with his biological sister openly on Twitter while simultaneously arguing with his current girlfriend slash ex-girlfriend at the time but it was one of them toxic relationships where they was never gonna leave each other alone basically and again when she had tweeted rock exes unite everyone kind of took that as a joke even the actual exes nobody was really offended nobody was really mad about it what they got mad at is that in the course of the argument between her and Desiree, when she said, you will get replaced like the rest of them girls, that was when the rest of them girls got offended. They, they got mad. They got really upset. So who was the rest of them girls? The rest of them girls were Nala Waynes, Kalani Lee, and Justice Domingo. So obviously all of them were offended and Nala Waynes was the first person to really speak her piece and say something. But... Her response was on Keek. I have not been able to find that response nowhere. Like literally nowhere. Nobody has a copy of it. Nobody has a repost of it. Nobody has nothing. But basically Nala took to Keek and I believe she put a name on it. I believe she put a name on it. So again, Beja seen that, she start going off. And she basically started calling that girl irrelevant. Now, Kalani didn't really have much to really say about the situation, but it was very clear that she caught the shade and she took it for what it was. And with Justice Domingo, she apparently was still friends with a lot of the OMG girls. So she just simply laughed at it and just kept it pushing. So it seems like she wasn't really hurt by it. And she would then turn around to co-sign Beja. So now she is somehow beefing with Desiree as well. So now they got their own separate thing going on. And what made that whole situation even worse, oh my God, it was rumored at the time, it was rumored that while he was messing with Desiree, he was still messing with Justice Domingo. So the fact that she was co-signing Beja and they ended up branching off and having their own tit for tat, the whole, uh, listen, this is a situation where you, you quite literally had to be there. It was all up in flames. All of it was up in flames. I'm surprised that Twitter didn't like lock up and shut down that day because honey, it was crazy. It was absolutely positively crazy. So I say all that to say, long story short, Beja, Beja started that. 
Beja started some shit. What can I say? Beja is the reason why all of that happened. I, I cannot lie to you. Beja did that. Beja did that. She did all of that. And it's just so crazy how one girl had all that power to do that. But hey, that that's a prime example of what I be talking about. Like, I remember it was one time, like, all of, all of Rock's, like, girlfriends was, like, beefed out at one time. And I was, like, Rock's exes unite. And everybody was, like, screaming. They was, like, why did you say that? <laughs> so to wrap this up, why was this such a big deal? And how was this a hindrance on the OMG girl's career? Well, for starters, it would have been way more helpful, beneficial, and way better of a good look if it wasn't just one person consistently speaking, speaking up, you know, it would have been way more beneficial if the other girls would have engaged in conversation and engaged with the fans a little bit more. But not only that, with Beja now being the spokesperson, knowing now that she didn't really have a chill mode, she didn't really have an off switch, she didn't really have a limit for what she was going to speak on, when she was going to speak on it, and so on and so forth. To the wrong people, it definitely would perceive the OMG girls as being these dramafied people. It would definitely seem as if these people are always in mess. So similar to the discussion that we had about the group We Are Charm, when you essentially build a reputation for being in drama, for consistently being in mess, a lot of people are not inclined to give you a second chance or give you a, a chance to, you know, get to know you better. And this can go for people that could be potential fans, this could go for brands, this could go for record deals, etc, etc. When you give yourself a reputation of always being crazy, of always being out there, people are going to notice that and that's always going to be a hindrance on a lot of stuff. And like I said, even though it was a given that Rihanna and Zanique, they just weren't very open people. At the end of the day, without that being clarified, because again, you never know who's watching you. Not everybody is a fan of an OMG girl and just watched the, the interview because, oh, it's the OMG girls. Some people watch interviews because they want to get to know the OMG girls. And the way that these interviews would be set up because, you know, the other two don't really want to talk and Beja is the one that would rather be the one talking, it also makes Beja look kind of bad because it looks as if she won't let the others speak when in reality, that's their personal preference. They actually enjoy that. But you have to understand, this is a job. This is, this is an image that you have to uphold and this is not a positive looking image for anybody. So another hurdle that the OMG girls had during the development of their careers, I would say really is to a degree misogyny, but for the most part, the bigger picture, mindless behavior. Yeah, and, and I love my boys, okay? I love my boys down, I do. But I feel like their affiliation with mindless behavior hindered their development and hindered their image. And I, I'm gonna I'm explain why, okay? So who is mindless behavior? Mindless behavior was a popular boy band in the early 2010s with hit singles like My Girl Used To Be and Mrs. Right. Even though the OMG girls technically debuted years before Mindless Behavior, around the time Mindless Behavior became breakout stars was also around the same time that the OMG girls were entering into their prime. Since both groups were on the Scream tour, they developed a close relationship with each other, and this caused a lot of fans and even entertainment outlets to see them as a package deal, or even sometimes as counterparts to each other. While this helped both parties grow to an extent, it also did a lot of damage to the OMG girls brand. So for starters, with them always being seen as a package deal, there were plenty of times where they would always invite the OMG girls to an event, but they would always have to include mindless behavior all the time. There was never a point in time where the OMG girls could literally just have their own situation, their own event, and that just be it. Well, I don't wanna say never, they did have a few, but it was like, the big venues they always had to invite mindless behavior like they could never just let the omg girls rock with their fan base and just be cool with you know just the collective of them they always assumed that in order for the omg girls to exist mindless behavior had to exist in the same space as well so a good example of this is that once upon a time there was an event in chicago at a skating rink 
where initially it was advertised as an OMG Girls event. So not only was it an event that was supposed to be hosted by them, but this also fell around the time of Beja's birthday. So they also doubled it as Beja's birthday party with the OMG Girls performing. Now this was an event that was supposed to be a little bit more intimate. It was supposed to be a little bit more of like a, not necessarily a meet and greet, but way more intimate than any other event at the time. And for reasons that we're not 100% aware of, at some point the venue decided that they were also going to invite mindless behavior. This was literally a last minute decision. This literally came out the blue. The whole entire time that this event was being promoted, it was promoted as if it was strictly the OMG girls and the OMG girls only. There were nobody else that was supposed to show up. Again, we don't know the exact reason, but I guess there was like a low amount of ticket sales or something of that nature. So the venue just decided, okay, we got to book both of them. Now this would have been fine if it was a situation where like all of their other friends showed up because hey, it's Beja's birthday, but it quite literally was just the OMG girls and mindless behavior. And mind you, the OMG girls were the ones that were promised to perform. So they literally paid mindless behavior just to show up. They literally paid them to just be there. And that was it. But it's like, given okay that that's a little bit of a something because mindless behavior isn't performing but do you not realize that like you kind of took the spotlight away from the omg girls like you kind of overrode what they had going on and it seemed like this was something that would be repeated a lot like there would always be an event that was supposed to be targeted for the omg girls and team omg which was their fan base and they always somehow would try to feature in mindless behavior every single time and when it wasn't mindless behavior, it was Diggy Simmons or Jacob Lattimore. Like the OMG girls could never just have an independent thing going on. But all of their other friends who happened to be male counterparts, they got to have an event to themselves. Nobody ever had to invite the OMG girls to help boost the ticket sales. Why on earth, when it comes to the OMG girls, y'all never give them that same energy? And honestly, I don't even think it was a situation of low ticket sales. I don't even think it was that. I think it was just something else because I refuse to believe that the OMG girls couldn't sell out a venue. I, I just don't believe that, but that could be a biased opinion of mine, but you never know. I, I have no idea what was going through their brains when they made those decisions, but I digress. The other issue is that even in the entertainment world, despite the fact that the bands had two separate names, they often were affiliated with each other a lot because to a degree, they did have a lot of similarities. Now given, one group is all boys, another group is all girls. The OMG girls consist of three girls. Mindless behavior consists of four boys. But the reality of it is, is that they both were a singing group that danced and had at least one rapper. They both appealed to black teenage girls, but obviously in different ways. They both were heavily based on fashion and freedom of creativity. And even with what they stood for, it was fairly similar. Again, officially misguided was the OMG girls. And it was basically girls that guide other girls. And we encourage you to be free and expressive. And that's why we wear crazy colors. That's why we wear these outfits. That's why we did our makeup this way. You know, it was all about expressing yourself and being your true authentic self. With mindless behavior, they use terms like don't be afraid to be mindless. And what that meant was don't be afraid to be yourself. Don't be afraid to express all of your inner quirks, all of the things that makes you a great person. So if you want to wear punk rocker tees, if you want to dress in skinny jeans, if you want to wear this, that, and the third, you should feel the freedom to do whatever you want to do because that's the whole point of being mindless. So how y'all get the name Mindless Behavior? Um, our managers, um, Keisha Gamble, watching us up when they were, um, well, during our development process, mm -hmm. we auditioned for the group. They thought Mindless Behavior was perfect, and a lot of people think Mindless is just being careless. And and crazy. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. but um, that it's just mind. being yourself, it's a lifestyle, not caring what other people think. So. I'm trying to say that we're being mindless. But do you see how not only are both of them kind of similar in their meaning behind each other, but they also are a play on words where the words used are actually supposed to mean something bad or mean something demeaning, and they switched it up to be something beautiful. So obviously misguided is supposed to be a play on the word misguided, but instead of the M-I-S, guided it's m-i-s-s -S, like 
miss like young girls and then with being mindless if somebody called you mindless you would take that as an insult because why are you calling me dumb why are you calling me crazy see what i'm saying like they they were very similar in that way and it didn't even stop there not only were they both signed to the same label but even down to their fan base the fan base of the omg girls was always hashtag t-o-m-g which stood for team omg and then mindless behavior fans were called team mindless also hashtag tm and I remember that being somewhat of like a confrontation or like a big uproar in like the fan base community because even on their official website, it was said that guiders and guiders with a G-U-Y, that was supposed to be the name of the OMG fan base, but somehow it morphed into Team OMG. So there was a lot of people from Team Mindless that just assumed like they were being copied. Now let's not play dumb. Let's not play like everything was just peaches and cream, okay? The biggest obvious reason why this was also a hindrance on the OMG girls' careers is because there were people that just automatically assumed that the girls from OMG girls were trying to date the members of Mindless Behavior. Now listen, I was a member of Team Mindless, okay? Y'all know them my boys and I don't play about my boys. So I know that even back in the past, they wasn't playing about them boys either. I already know that. I'm already aware of that. They can be very aggressive. They can be very heavy handed with a lot of the things that they do. Because in they head, when they put that username, Princeton's wifey, that was really supposed to be his wifey and you couldn't tell him otherwise. Like, no, you're not coming in between me and my man. So of course, with that being a factor, that caused a lot of jealousy within the Team Mindless fan base and Team Mindless automatically just ripped the OMG girls off and did not like them girls whatsoever. Not me though, I was one of the normal ones. I was one of the normal ones, but I'm not gonna lie, it's the truth, it, it happened. So it was always reiterated and stated by both teams, by both parties, that they were just strictly friends. They seen each other as brother and sister. It was nothing romantic going on. Like the little mindless behavior boys, are they hollering at you? No, no like no, we're not all anybody. just family. Yeah. Like, everybody always be like, oh, you know, you guys are always together. So like y'all go out and y'all are talking, but not, it's not even like that. Like we're just really cool that we're all family. Mm -hmm. right. Nobody ever tried to kiss anybody or anything? Oh, no. Mm -hmm. Nah. No, <laughs> she said like it was so tour, gross. Like friends, yeah. <laughs> no. So what brings you guys out tonight? Uh, well, you know, we're uh, label mates with the OMG girls, and they're nominated, and this is their first award, so we're really good friends with them. We came to support and promote our uh, movie. However, there would be a lot of situations where people would heavily speculate that that was the opposite of what was going on. The first incident of this being like a big major issue and there being a gigantic rumor that the OMG girls were dating members of Mindless Behavior, there was a picture that hit media takeout. And it was a picture of Rock Royal and Zanique and they were in bed together. But it wasn't as scandalous as it sounds. It literally looks like they chilling. It don't look like anything, you know, raunchy, crazy, you know, it, it's, it's not that big of a deal. But in the same breath, again, the societal programming that black girls had to go through, you're not supposed to be in bed with the man, period. So, so even though that picture didn't show anything, it was just too suggestive for a lot of the audiences. And then it was like, I remember somebody had speculated, like, what if she doesn't have pants on? And I'm just like, why would that be your first thought? But you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, that was like the first incident of that being a big, huge, major thing. It was assumed for a really long time that Zonique and Rock were dating. It was when, oh, do you remember that one time? I can't remember what it was, but it was it was something that happened. Like we ended up being on a blog or something like that. Or I think Rock and Neek were on a blog and they was like, Oh, like on media takeout back when media takeout was like the thing and it was on media takeout and remember like everybody had a whole call and was it was like we couldn't hang out no more all this stuff and then we was like hell no uh-uh and again team mindless always had a hunch about something team mindless did not know how to mind their business like at all so as it turns out eventually Zonique and member Ray Ray actually did end up dating in real life. And I guess they were trying to keep it a secret. I'm, I'm 
assuming that was the attempt but like it was kind of obvious at the same time so it's like I don't know like it wasn't as secretive as like Rock Royal and all his other exes like all of them they could have still been alleged if it wasn't for that whole Twitter fiasco but with them it was like girl do you think we stupid like I'm trying to figure this out I think you think I'm dumb like I think you really think that everybody is dumb because this was not you were not hiding this well you were not hiding this well at all like you're a terrible liar <laughs> you guys are terrible liars and unfortunately I gotta bring up Beja again I do I'm not trying to bully that girl I'm not trying to bully that girl but I gotta bring up Beja's mouth all over again because I'm gonna be honest there were plenty of times where Beja would purposely tweet things or post certain things that she knew would get a rise out of the mindless behavior fan base. She never dated any of the members, not at any point in time. She never dated any of the members, but she would purposely put certain things out there so that it was interpreted a certain way so that it looked a certain way. Essentially, she was always trolling. You know, like she was just always trolling and Team Mindless. And Team Mindless would always fall for it. Again, not me though, I was normal. But you know, Team Mindless always fell for it. And even the times when she would be defending the boys and like, you know, basically jumping into their mix, like I told y'all that she does a lot, she would defend them as if it's like, this your man. Like it don't give this my brother, it gives this is my man. And again, she could have been trolling or she could have just been like, in a blind rage and just didn't care about how she came off I don't know but it always kind of gave that impression and again Zonique and Ray Ray sucked at trying to hide whatever it was that they had so we're aware of them at this point we don't put nothing past nobody else and the tipping point oh my god listen I'm telling you these are situations you just had to be there to experience it the tipping point another moment where not even just twitter all of social media was in a frenzy and was on fire honey so mindless behavior went on their first tour their own headlining tour and it was called the number one girl tour there was a segment on that tour where they would bring fans on stage and they would serenade that fan this was something that people were looking forward to, that they were sought after, especially after they had heard and seen it for the first time. They were like, that's gotta be me. How do I get that? You had people like basically buying like VIP packages. I don't think that's how you got on stage. I'm not 100% sure. But basically people just started like scrambling. They're just like, I gotta get this VIP pass. I gotta do a meet and greet. They gotta know who I am. They gotta know my name. And if you were, you know, in the trenches you used to read fan fiction too so it's like even in the fan fiction it was like this is a dream come true everybody wanted a piece so then they get to the leg of the tour where they stop in atlanta georgia and instead of inviting fans onto the stage they invited the omg girls oh they were pissed oh people were pissed people were pissed they were heated okay they were upset so long story short how does their affiliation with mindless behavior really put a hindrance on their development to be honest as far as their careers go mindless behavior was the more successful of the two groups again even though omg was actually here way before mindless behavior they had way more work to do in order to be taken seriously as a singing group so in a way even though they weren't technically a new artist in the eyes of mainstream media and the entertainment industry, they were still fairly new. Whereas with Mindless Behavior, they had a lot of accomplishments under their belt by this point. They had worked with so many artists like Justin Bieber, Jason Derulo. They went on tour with Backstreet Boy and Janet Jackson. Like they were out there doing it big. They were out there doing it major. They had already like by this point, I think they had like yeah, because All Around the World did get released. So they had two albums out and had went on two tours. Plus, they headlined the first Scream tour, which featured the OMG girls as the opening act. With the OMG girls, they were still, you know, getting their feet wet. They still, like, trying to get their leg up. They still haven't had their own tour. They kept pushing the album back. And if you look at certain OMG girl performances, 
they don't really go to that many arenas unless they're being affiliated with someone else's tour. But for the most part, their events and their like series of concerts, it would always be really intimate events. It would always be something really small. So with people always seeing the OMG girls as a supplement or an extension of mindless behavior, that kind of downplayed what the girls were even capable of doing in the first place. But not only that, it didn't really give them a chance to build their own fan base. Like again, there were plenty of people that were fans of OMG girls plus mindless behavior at the same time. But in the same breath, it's like mindless behavior had their own fan base. Diggy Simmons had his own fan base. Jacob Lattimore had his own fan base. The OMG girls had their own fan base, but it was clear that they still were building one and they never got a chance to really authentically build one because every time they try to book an event, here comes mindless behavior. Every time they're trying to do a segment on 106 and Park, here goes mindless behavior. Like they shouldn't be seen as a package deal. And also on the business aspect of all of this, mindless behavior was always seen as a huge comparison to the OMG girls as far as what they've accomplished. Because with them being signed to the same label, people started to question like, okay, well, why do they get to have this, but the OMG girls still don't have that? What's that about? And there became a lot of unfair comparisons between the two. Because being a girl group and being a boy band are two completely different things that have two completely different struggles, but nobody really cared. And nobody took that into consideration because get to it. You know, like that, that really did put a hindrance on their whole entire career development. And I'm the type of person where even the smallest things is a big accomplishment to me. So I also just feel like the little accomplishments that the OMG girls were making, it definitely got overshadowed because they kept being compared to their male counterparts. And that's not fair. So all in all, it's really nothing wrong with them and mindless behavior being really close and being really affiliated with each other. But I don't think it was fair to always have them as like a group project or like a joint custody situation. Like they should have been able to do their own respective things. And maybe if, if marketing was smart, the mindless behavior OMG tour, you know, mixtape or something like have a project that makes sense for them to come together. But like to just keep putting them in the same room in the same category it just doesn't work that way and it was completely unfair to the omg girls so the last hurdle that the omg girls would have to face in the development of their careers was being signed to interscope records interscope records was found in 1990 by jim levine and ted field this label helped the careers of artists like snoop dogg lady gaga eminem and even helped the development of the headphones beats by dre they also helped popularize the music genre gangsta rap, which was very controversial at the time and had a close connection with iTunes to make sure their artists get paid what they deserve. In many ways, Interscope Records broke the mold within not only the world of record labels, but also within music. They would continue to do so going into the 2010s by being the record label that signed major acts such as Mindless Behavior, Chief Keef, Lil Durk, and K Camp. In 2011, the OMG girls would be added to that roster. Many fans seen this as the OMG girls' big break, but as stated time and time again, they never released a project or got their own tour. Let's look into how these things happen. So realistically speaking, Interscope Records has a history of delaying people's projects. In 2015, the rapper Kendrick Lamar was set to release his album to Pimp a Butterfly. It was supposed to be released March 23rd of that year, but somehow got released on iTunes on March 15th, eight days before its announced date. Now they would eventually take this down and re-release it on the day that it was supposed to be released, but the damage was already done. They even did this with well-established artists like Elton John. Female rapper Eve even had her album, Lip Lock, delayed for three straight days years and apparently a singing group from south africa i want to say it's pronounced die is it die antwood but die antwood apparently had their album delayed as well and the label even told them that they don't even think that the album would be able to really make it mainstream so they kept delaying their album by telling them that they still needed work to do and they would do the work present it and it would just be the same cycle all over again and eventually they would leave the label in 2011 and release their records under Zeph Records. And artists like 50 Cent and SZA would experience that exact same treatment as Die Antwood. So obviously that's just red flag number one. 
But let's also point out the fact that the exact thing that the OMG girls were going through is something that record labels still do to this day. Record labels have a tendency to sign people to their labels and work with them when they feel like it. So they just wanna be able to say that they have an artist on lock. They just wanna be able to have something in their arsenal in case their big wigs, their big name artists somehow, I don't know, get caught in controversy and they have to let them go for the sake of publicity. That's when all of a sudden they'll start messing with the artists that they signed five years ago. What they tend to do is only focus on the current artists that are making them the most money. Everybody else, they get second to last. They don't get as much attention in the first place. Now, it would be different if they feel like you really had the potential to be a star, and that's how we get people like the industry plans. If they see that there's a formula that's working, they'll go out and purposely look for someone that fits that formula, and they'll morph them into this version of themselves that they want them to be. And from that moment on, the new artist gets pushed. But if you're a new artist and you just happen to get signed, nine times out of 10, they're not taking you seriously in the first place. So to give you a prime example, this not only happened with Interscope, but it also happened with a very popular artist. And who is this artist? Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga was signed to the record for two years straight before she actually got a chance to have a debut album. If it wasn't for the artist Akon discovering Lady Gaga and helped push her career, Lady Gaga would not be Lady Gaga that we know today. Another reason why I'm pointing this out as well is because it has been reported multiple times that Interscope actually messes up a lot of brand deals for a lot of artists as well. While Mindless Behavior was promoting Beats by Dre and doing a deal with Target to promote their sophomore album, the OMG girls got a deal with a company called Wata. Now, what is Wata? What is this company? It, it's literally water. It, it's, it's literally bottles of water. That was it. That, that, was, that was the brand deal, was water. So. so the thing is, is that Wata apparently wasn't a normal water company. It was a company that was supposed to help promote kids to have a healthy lifestyle and to stay hydrated while also stay active. And the way that they motivated the kids to do this was having colorful labels on the bottle. So, ta-da, basically. And the thing is, the, the thing is, is that the, the marketing ploy which is why the OMG girls were affiliated, was that they had bottles that matched with the color of their hair, like basically the signature colors that they had. So there was one label that was pink, there was one label that was purple, and there was one label that was blue. But like, it was literally bottles that they were already selling. This was not special edition OMG girls bottles. It, it, it was nothing... It was nothing big, it was nothing major. It, it quite literally was a bottle that they already sold. They already had that color. This was not just invented for the OMG girls. So, yep, that was the brand deal. That that was the brand deal. That was the, that was the opportunity, so, yeah. And no, the water was not like a flavored water. No, it, it quite literally was just water. Like, water, it, it, was, it was water. Mm -hmm. It was just water. There was no sweepstakes. There was no, hey, if you buy this and you look under the bottle cap, you get a chance to win a meet and greet with us, to spend the day with us, go shopping with us. No, they quite literally put water in a bottle and told them, promote this, like convince your audience to want to buy this. This is the brand. It's water, y'all. Like it's, it's literally water. So I take it back. They did have a contest. If you tweet the following tweet down below, you get a chance to win a follow back from each of the members of the OMG girls for free. That that's the that that was that was the motivation to yep. <laughs> now here's my thing. There is nothing wrong with being affiliated with something that's supposed to be promoting children's health. That's not what had me, okay? What had me is that you made them brand ambassadors and the appeal 
was that the plain ass label that was already on the bottle can match your favorite color and that was it again no sweepstakes that's the least y'all could have did a sweepstakes the least y'all could have done was hey every bottle you buy you get a ticket to a raffle and you get picked to do whatever nothing they literally said this is a bottle of water make it marketable that was it that was it that was it and and my thing is just like how do you drop the ball that bad how do you sit here and drop the ball that bad and listen because i remember the shock the initial shock when i heard of this big announcement because they hyped it up too they said it was a big announcement okay i remember when this first popped off and i i was probably more dumbfounded than what i am now but now i'm really completely utterly like i cannot believe that that was a situation that actually happened because number one this is a company that has worked with big artists like beyonce and ariana grande i highly doubt that y'all didn't have the funds to put a little bit more oomph into this campaign like I, I refuse to believe that you were able to afford beyonce like hello and then not only that i'm not trying to start no rivalries i'm not trying to start no fan wars or nothing like that like it, it's not that it's just that again where was the effort where was the oomph where was anything because ariana grande when she was an ambassador of the brand there was effort put into her campaign the bottles were unique the bottles had a specific color a specific look and not only that, this girl was able to promote this brand out of the comfort of her home or her hotel or wherever she was at. But long story short, she stood in front of a plain white wall and told people to drink water and that was good enough for the brand. Like, I remember what my initial shock was when they went through the process of giving us a big announcement. They hyped it up so well just to be given this like it, it's like this was this was it like this was it and my whole thing is this they had the budget to where they could have made an actual campaign for the omg girls they had the budget to where they could have done something better for the omg girls there is nothing wrong with promoting children's health there's nothing wrong with keeping them hydrated motivated and all that other stuff and then this was during like the height of like you know um the health kick for kids and defeating childhood obesity and stuff like that it was on brand it was on brand but the omg girls are so much more than just colors and i feel like the fact that you made them promote a bottle that already exists and just made it seem as if this was omg girl coded because you have pink purple and blue labels plain pink purple and blue labels and really convince them to promote it. it it's crazy to me because you've had the budget to not only involve beyonce in a campaign but y'all went through some type of legal process to where she created a whole different variation of the song get me bodied called move your body and i mean i i, I know that wasn't cheap and you were able to do that and when you had ariana grande as a brand ambassador she had a whole rollout she had unique bottles they were a specific color the label didn't even remind you of the brand it reminded you of ariana grande and her fragrance and her upcoming album how is it that you have the budget to do all of that but you didn't have the budget with the omg girls the omg girls have to settle for a half-ass photo shoot with empty bottles in a cart and you made one of them get in it and and that was the photo shoot the photo shoot was being excited about this water bottle and really and the girls oh they they tried okay they tried their hardest to hype this water bottle up to be something interesting they know they didn't even care okay like this was terrible i'm telling you the whole thing the whole campaign was so terrible and it was so terrible and it made me so mad because i have free time on my hands a little bit too much yeah i made my own mock-ups of the omg girl campaign and what they could have done with the wata like i'm i'm so serious i made up my own mock-ups specifically for this wata situation because i really cannot fathom that the answer was just so simple 
and yet we couldn't do it for whatever reason like I just refuse to believe that because it quite literally was that simple and we actively chose that we are not going to give them more than what they deserve like that was an act of choice and then on the aspect of just the omg girls brand in general right again the omg girls as a brand was centered around being free with the way that you express yourself down to the hair the nails the clothes the makeup you know everything in between i would think the best course of action and the most lucrative piece of action that they could have done would have been like have a deal with like dove that already supports like feminine beauty and uplifting young girls and stuff like that teen spirit deodorant i mean it's literally in the name plus healthy hygiene and yeah they did have one that was pink crush wasn't that what it was called it was something like that and even then labels oh are pretty better than better than whatever that was so you know like that would have made sense on the clothing aspect forever 21 perfect collaboration especially because they already shop there and even though it's a little ghetto even though it's a little ghetto it's a little too deep in the trenches i ain't gonna lie city trends and rainbow was right there they practically carried all the outfits that the omg girls have ever worn in their life literally kid you not if you know you know so it's like those would have made sense to me a mac deal would have made sense to me you know things like that we here with it. We see that. I get that. Wata, a water company, and it's literally a bottle that that just is a bottle. Nothing new. Nothing major. No. 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 Nothing. Nothing. Really. Nothing else. Like they definitely lowballed the OMG girls. One hundred percent. They lowballed the OMG girls so bad. So so bad. There was so much potential there. And we just dropped the ball but i'm proud of them for at least being good sports and trying to keep the momentum going and trying to like make it seem like it was this big interesting thing but it really wasn't it really wasn't it was actually very tragic it was very sad and that's so stupid like i can't believe that and i also want to point this out too about wata i've never seen it in stores i don't even know where they sell that so it's like even then you're accessible to kids but you're not accessible to everybody what's that about i don't use it uh, stupid very stupid i'm done like i i have no words i really don't so to wrap this segment up basically being signed to interscope records seemed like it was a step in the right direction initially for the omg girls but it had been proven to be the complete opposite these girls were not watered enough to be the best of the best even though they had the star power to do so and because of that this led to the album cover being released but us never actually getting the album. The album would be consistently pushed back time and time and time and time again. Fans were given single after single, snippet after snippet, and after a lack of work being produced, the OMG girls finally left Interscope Records and decided to rebrand for the last time into a more mature sound and look. Unfortunately, they would release their last single, which was a cover of Girl It's Over. And shortly after the release of that single, they disbanded. And that was the end of the OMG Girls. No album, still to this day. So now we're in present day. Where are these girls at now? After Regine left the group in 2010, she would take a break from everything and go back to being a regular teenager and investing in cheerleading. In 2011, her and her fellow previous member Lourdes would go on to create their own YouTube channel together titled Nay Nay and Lolo TV. They both would abandon the channel eventually and Regine would go back to doing music. She would release Daddy's Little Girl and Mind Going Crazy on her new YouTube channel, Regine's World, where she gave people a glimpse into her creative process and personal life. But she would go on to abandon that channel as well as her music career. She would go on to do promotions and brand deals through her Instagram and eventually would get accepted into Clark Atlanta University, but after her first year of college, she would drop out. She would go on to do reality television on her own by appearing in the show My Sweet 16 and the first season of Growing Up Hip Hop Atlanta. While on Growing Up Hip Hop Atlanta, she showed interest in pursuing acting. 
She would leave Growing Up Hip Hop because she didn't like how she was being portrayed on the show and would appear on T.I. and Tiny's Friends and Family Hustle. And she began booking acting roles in movies like Boxed In, Social Society, Terror Lake Drive, and Boxed In 2. As of today, she appears on a reality show with her mother called Toya and Regine. She owns an active wear line called I Fit In. And she has a new YouTube channel, which is called Regine Carter, which she has been very consistent on. Lourdes would go on to still pursue a music career as a rapper and release a snippet of her song, Get Low. She would also be featured on Regine's song, Daddy's Little Girl. While her and Regine had a YouTube channel, they made a song called Haters Going Crazy, a rendition to Speakers Going Hammer by Soldier Boy. She continued to finish high school and went on to graduate from Clark Atlanta University with a degree in criminal justice. She now has a regular nine to five job, but also runs an Airbnb with her sister, Beja, as well as have a YouTube channel called Life with Lourdes. And she also joined motherhood as of recently by having her baby girl. After the OMG Girls, Zonique would continue to do music, releasing her two EPs and eight singles. She would continue with her reality star career by appearing in T.I. and Tiny The Family Hustle, T.I. and Tiny Friends and Family Hustle, and Growing Up Hip Hop Atlanta. She appeared in three movies, Rock the Boat, Rock the Boat 2, and Three's Company, so she's been trying out acting as well. And she gave birth to her daughter in 2020 and started her own YouTube channel. Beja also went on to make her way in music with five EPs and three albums. As I previously stated, she runs an Airbnb with her sister Lourdes, and she too has her own YouTube channel. Brianna went on to make music, releasing two singles, but for the most part, she's doing her usual and laying low. The OMG girls, new and old, never stopped being friends with each other. Since they originated as family, they stayed as family. And since the group didn't break up because of any beef, they always stayed on good terms with each other. In January 2018, Brianna, Beja, and Zonique briefly reunited for the Escape Reunion Tour, and it caused a lot of buzz from fans. But this was just supposed to be a one-time thing, and they went right back to doing their solo careers. Ironically, their lawsuit with MGA actually reunited the trio. Not only did they start to spend more time together due to the court case, but while fighting for their likeness being used, they were reminded of the impact they made despite having no album. This caused them to decide to reunite the OMG girls, now going by OMG, and releasing their most anticipated snippet, Loverboy. The OMG girls are now officially back together and they plan on going on tour very soon. So by the time you guys get this video, it will be like a week or two before the tour actually starts. And it's been some whispers here and there from all of the members, even Lourdes, that they're apparently working on an album. So hopefully this album has all of the songs that we didn't get to hear, but I also hope that it's some new stuff because I want to hear the new OMG. So guys, that is the story of what happened to the OMG girls. If you guys enjoyed this video, please do not forget to like this video. Comment down below, how are you feeling now that OMG is now reunited again and we're gonna finally get that album. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't so you can always be on time for the What Happened To series. And of course, share if you can. So with that being said, I thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you next time. Impossible. Yeah.